Hello there. Hello there. Welcome to Pot Crash. You've got some fancy headphones. Thank you. Um, you know, you <laughs> had them on last time, and uh, apparently, I was making a lot of weird noises on the podcast. So you were, uh, so I thought I have to wear headphones. We've got everyone with headphones now to stop all the RLSM or whatever it's called. Yeah, and we got some news this week, haven't we? We have some news. So it's been a big week for us because the podcast has launched officially. Yes. People have been talking about it for years. They're like, when are Phil and Callum going to do a podcast? And it's finally happened. That's after the the, 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 the romance from the vlogs, right? It is, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. Um, also, we should probably introduce our guest this week. I think I've jumped the gun a little bit. <laughs> but we have, yeah. Just a random off the street. Sat in the middle. <laughs> Wait, this follow. is a podcast. At the point, people can't see you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. But they will see you on YouTube. Um, so, Phil, would you like to do an intro? Uh, we've got Kyle Evans here, beer mixer from on the GB program and a teammate for quite a long time. Two-time Olympian. Two-time Olympian, European champion. European champion. Any other accolades we've missed there? Pick yourself up, mate. Try a few. I got <laughs> second at the World Cup once. Nice. Won the European Series as well. I mean, oh, we're, we're going to get on to it, but good. BMX is so. hard. Yeah, Let's put this to the side first. Yeah, we're going to put that to the side. Through the news. We're going to go through the news first. Okay, so the podcast launched and it was a big deal. We Not had deal. literally tens of comments from people all around the world. Yes, it was a big deal, and we had some positive feedback. We did have some positive feedback. I was quite surprised about yeah, it. Our friends were being quite nasty about it, but... Um, they're a lot nasty about everything. Yeah, they're haters. Yeah, they're haters. They're haters. Let's, like, go, let's go on with the news. Okay, then. sorry, more news, more news. More uh, news. So, yeah, we've got a theme tune. We've we got a theme tune, yeah. We haven't listened to it yet. No, it's going to be a surprise. Might be in here, might not be. We will see. Yeah. Uh, we've got a sponsor for this week. Who is the sponsor? The sponsor is this book here by Alan Murchison. <laughs> The uh, cycling chef. The cycling chef. Now, Alan. Alan's a great guy. Have you met Alan, Kyle? Uh, no, we we don't get enough budget. Okay, to send, right, uh, let's <laughs> let's to stop with the negativity, <laughs> please. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get onto that later. Okay, okay, okay. Um, so, Phil, do you want to hold the book and uh, show it to the camera for people who are watching yeah, on YouTube? Are. The cycling chef. So, Alan was uh, had multiple Michelin star restaurants, and now he's a very keen cyclist. Uh, great guy, great Scott. Travels around the world with us, cooks for us at major competitions. And he does, yeah. and he, and you know what? He's got you passionate about nutrition. Yes, yeah. I've um, upped my cooking game just a little bit. <laughs> I thought <laughs> from the um, one time we were and we met up for a coffee once at LPs, and you actually turned up and said, "One second, guys, I've not had my lunch yet." And you had a plastic bag that this is gospel. <laughs> Go on there, can't he, you remember he, what you he got had? To say? He had a plastic bag with him from like co-op, and I. Is it um? Is this like a uh, clean or is it? Oh, you can say whatever you want. Oh, yeah, that's and I good. kid you not, this guy pulled out salmon and breadsticks <laughs> with a with with a, with a cheese and chive dip, and he just went. He looked at me and he just went, protein, carbs. That's all I need. <laughs> <laughs> and that What's was his lunch after gym. But coincidentally enough, that's one of the recipes in Alan's book. It's called <laughs> salmon in a bag with breadsticks. And and I was ahead of the game. <laughs> ahead of the game. <laughs> I'll give you that. Bro. And uh, I think that's what's known in Germany as a creamy salsa. Creamy salsa. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Say creamy cheese and chive sauce in German. Ah, I don't speak any German anymore. Yeah, it's so. Kaiser, <laughs> Kaiser is one of them. What's chive? Let's go with the news. Well, you can th- while I go through the news, you I can think, think about, about it. To say it. Yeah. Your, term, your German is awful these days. I know, I don't speak it anymore. Anyway, uh, yeah, so we got a theme tune. Derek is actually quite a good musician. He once supported the Arctic Monkeys. Did he actually? Yeah, actually, yeah. He used Derek to is uh, Callum's stepdad. Yeah, um, he's, uh, he does finance by day and music by night. So we're expecting big things. I, I was thinking we'd get well, something truly awful. Oh, let's let's when wait you and said see. the theme tune, have you... Um, like the theme tune, sing the theme tune. <laughs> <laughs> the, what's that off? It's little like Britain. Little Britain or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. And they do, do, do. I was just in my head instantly was thinking that. I was like, wow. Um, um, so, yeah, we're going to have the theme tune. Derek's written the theme tune. I'm excited. <laughs> I'm excited. <laughs> Is Derek really small and sits on, <laughs> sits on a huge chair? <laughs> uh, so, yeah, we got worldwide, literally worldwide feedback. That's the reach of podcasts these days. Um, so, the theme tune's coming in. Uh, Hannah Dines tweeted saying thank you for choosing Pod Crash as the name. So we that's going to, to well. we have to thank Hannah. We have to thank Hannah giving us the suggestion. We're going to get Hannah on some point because she's got a lot of interesting things to say actually. Um, I think she's agreed in principle. Good. Um, also, some people some people alleged last time that I was drunk during the podcast, and I take issue with that. Go on then. Well, well I don't think you defended me to the people that you. 
first of, and also someone said, why is Callum drinking out the bottle? He's above that. I mean, you were very excited on Saturday that we in town we found a place called Oyster Bar and they were selling two pound pints and you were very excited. It's unbelievable. There's this place next to Selfridges in town and if you're listening to this in Brazil and you don't know what Selfridges is, Selfridges is it's like it's fancy. It's a shopping center. No, no, no. It's a no, department no, no, store. No, yeah. no, 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 no. It's fancier than that. It it's has very like fancy. Balenciaga. It has Christian Louboutin, Gucci. It's got the Hermes. It's got the whole lot. It's the shebang. It's like... It's got nail bars. It's where you go it for your girlfriend at Christmas. Right. The one place all men go <laughs> <at> Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, Christmas. Uh, uh, Christmas or birthday is coming up. Loss for should 11 I go? months of the year until December. And then yeah. it's an absolute <laughs> panic killing. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. But anyway, so if you're in Manchester, go to the Oyster Bar. Two pound pints is unbelievable. That's like three US dollars. Yeah, you lost the plot there a bit, didn't you? you just <laughs> I got a bit ahead of myself. More and more pints. I just, I had to, I had to take advantage of it. And plus they also, weirdly for such a cheap pub, they also sell oysters, which is kind of in the name. I probably wouldn't try the oysters in this bar. <laughs> no, I wouldn't either. The floor was a bit sticky. Um, other news is I'm a shell because did, I'm doing a comeback. I did a ride today. 80Ks. 80Ks? Didn't take any food. Crashed at the top of Cat. You no, crashed. I didn't crash. Like crashed. At, oh. Like bonked, bonked yeah. at the top of Cat and Fiddle. Who did you do the ride with? Myself. Just by yourself? I like to get, I like to go out sometimes. Just me and me and the bike. Oh, fair play. So yeah, it was great. Um, and well also, done. well done. Thank you. Well done. Thanks. I think he actually means that for once. Sometimes he does. Like, sometimes he does. You know, he catches you, you off you guard never sometimes. Sh- you never <laughs> sure. You're surprised sometimes, though, you? sometimes yeah. he says like he gives you a nice compliment. You look at him twice, like. Hold on. <laughs> like you do actually do. I've done it many a times. Who is this guy? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So and also, you know what else he said was nice? We were watching Flanders at the week. No, we were watching Pali Nice at the weekend. Flanders. No, Pali Nice. Oh, pa- pa- <laughs> Pali the Bay. Pali the Bay. Yeah, Pali the Bay. And he said to me, and he had to check himself. Like he said it, and then he was like, "Shit, why have I said that?" <laughs> he said, "Callum, one day I could see you doing this." And I was like, "It was definitely a joke." No, it wasn't. It was serious because immediately you went, serious. "Oh <laughs> no, that's not me. I shouldn't have said that." Recoiled. Quick. Exactly. He went straight back in. Uh, but yeah, but other news for me this week is that BC have asked for my Cervelo back. What are you gonna do? It's missing. It's, it's gone missing. Something. It's gone missing. <laughs> yeah. Stolen. What, what bike did you do the ride on today? On, on my city bike, my giant. <laughs> oh, fair play. It's genuinely gone missing. I don't know where it is. If if anyone finds a Cervelo R5 with Juice mechanical on it, but it, to be honest, it means a lot to me. So I'm I'm a bit reluctant to give back the missing bike. I can understand that. Mm. I've had it for three years. I took it to the Olympics. I don't have my Olympic bike anymore. That's gone. No, no. Yeah, that's true. I'll be bikeless. I understand you, yeah. Except I've got some things in the... That could be great for sponsorship, though. Could be great for sponsorship, no? yeah. yeah. Anyone out there wants to, you know, provide oh, no, There's, some, there's something in the pipeline. Oh, is that for another podcast? Might be. Okay, well, I won't, um, I won't ask for sponsorship. So, have you got any more that. news? Or is this a no, no, no. Uh, also, I was at an anti-doping conference yesterday. Oh, yeah, you were. And what I met, was that? It was good. I met the chief exec of Lusada, the Russian anti-doping agency, which sounds like an oxymoron, but it's not. Um, lovely man. What did you talk about? Uh, he, he took issue with a few of the things I was saying. Like what? Give us an example. Well, because the Russian doping scandal is quite a big deal. Yeah, no, if you've been... You know, and I, s- I basically said, that's not good. And he went, hold on. What about the clean athletes in Russia? And we talked a little bit more about that. Lovely man, though. Did you revert it back, though? Cl- to the doping back <laughs> did, you, did you revert it back <laughs> to the doping? <laughs> Straight back in. Like Mr. Miyagi. Like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, you've got some news. I've, I have, yeah. Um... Had my home gym installed yesterday. Wow. Um, finally, I can... <laughs> well, I don't know why you're laughing, mate. Because this, was... this guy said to me today, <laughs> I saw him at training, he came in and he was like, oh, it's like, what's new, Phil? He's like... <laughs> it's going to come out of your mouth now. <laughs> and he goes, oh, yes, I've had a, I've had a home gym installed. It's um, just like uh, better than Man City's. <laughs> Better than Man City's gym. <laughs> Say but he, that. Meant, he meant it was the company that built Man City's have helped ah, him to build the one. I didn't but say the it way was it better. Came I said out, it yes, you did. The same. Okay, the same. You Pretty posted on Twitter. It's a bit smaller. You posted on Twitter and Instagram a video of you squatting. I and did. No, an Insta story. Insta story. The form wasn't great. There was a bit of a butt wink in there that I haven't seen before. It looked like a little struggle. It was pretty hard, I have to say. You be careful there, because it's only you in that gym. 
I've got safety bars. You don't worry about me. He has Claire. I've he has been, Claire. I've she been, spots him. I've been very good recently. Is Claire a good spotter? Um, well, we find out. Hopefully, <laughs> <one>. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be multiple slip discs in the future. <laughs> I think we should put move our attention on. to this guy. Okay, yeah. So we're going to move on to the main bit of the podcast. Uh, this week, we're <coughs> joined by Kyle Evans, otherwise known as Kev. That's probably my first question. Why are you known as Kev? Um... Not really a special story about that. It was, um, as you both know, being on the program, all the files get saved with initial initials. So mm. first letter, second letter, and then the second letter of your second name. Turns out man's Carl Evans, K-E, with a V on the end. Yeah. Looks as Kev. Was in a meeting one time with my coach, Grant, and we was trying to look for a certain file, and straight away he was like, hmm, Right, let me just find, bring this file up, scrolling through, and he's like, all of a sudden, he just starts mumbling Kev. He's like, <laughs> Kev, 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 Kev. And then he like just clicked it up and was like, who's Kev? And he's like, <laughs> oh, it's saved as Kev. Like, and then we was like, oh, and then it started. It started as like Kev, Kevlar, because he's Australian. So he was like, Kevlar. Ah. <laughs> so he started that, and then it just kind of stuck from there. So it's kind of like Kev, Kevlar, the, Kevin. It, it did cause issues when we did actually have a Kev on the team, though. Yeah, it does. It, we when I'm in the mechanics or whatever, and we see um, like Kev Stewart walks in, the coach, someone will say Kev, and sometimes I'll perk up and have a little <laughs> look, and then like, we'll be like, oh, it's not me, it's not me. But yeah, just get your name changed. Yeah, yeah. Which is the weird thing, but like you're 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 not a small guy, but Kev is huge. So yeah, now it's yeah, big Kev, a, little Kev. Big Kev, little Kev. You've got a few nicknames, Phil. Fifi, it's one of them. Yeah, <laughs> remember the time you were called uh, Rocky. Rocky, yeah. yeah. I still, that's, I still have him uh, saved in my phone as Rocky. Yeah. Because <laughs> that's how I was first introduced <laughs> to Phil. Rocky. Uh, one with a foot in it as well? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Don't okay. know what you're <laughs> All right, moving on. Um, so I thought we'd, we'd, we'd get the pleasantries out of the way. We'd talk about your major, your major like, palamis, 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 palumis. What do people say? Palamaris. Palamaris, yes. What is clean chive in... German, cheese and chives. I'm still thinking about it. Mate, you've lost it. I know, I know, terrible. Anyway, so the European champs, I watched it back the other day and I was like, wow. Like you got the world champion in there. That's a heavy heat. It was, it was a big race, to be fair. Like you led it from the front like an absolute king. Yeah, look, I mean, looking back at it, like that whole weekend, well, the whole week leading into that race was a whirlwind. So, I mean, yeah, I'll start from the beginning and... As I say, we was getting prepared for the race. Clark and Kent, one of my sponsors, they build tracks. And if you've ever seen, I have the helmet, Clark and Kent contractors. And and they basically built the track. It got sat there, left there for months and months just before the event. They got some work done. Um, okay, sorry. <laughs> so they got some work done and they wanted me to like basically come and test it. So bearing in mind, we was racing, like practice was Thursday. Uh, practice was Thursday. First qualifying was Friday, racing was Saturday, well, finals was Saturday. So you had you're a hand in, in designing the track and giving feedback? No, nah, not really, just literally because the track was made, so there was no major changes they could do, but yeah. they ran a national there about a month beforehand, So and I didn't compete at that national. Uh, but the feedback that they got from the national was, oh, a lot of things need changing. Um, but that was from an amateur's perspective because it was nationals, amateurs raced it, no pros had raced it, so it was kind of like... Okay, well, maybe there's some tweaks that need doing on the amateur side, but that still doesn't really line up with what's going to happen when it comes to a European Championships and an and elite class go off the big hill. So, so when it when it comes to that feedback, I guess that was some that was a big issue in Rio, wasn't it? Yeah, like Rio was mental. We I think we went back and forth twice now. Um, we got there the first time, and we could not ride that track. It was a death trap. What was hard about it? Just everything. I mean, the jump, the shape of the jumps that were built, uh, the sizes of them. I remember looking. I mean, I think like I still have a, a photo online, or at least on my um, on my phone somewhere. There's a picture of Liam stood at the bottom of the takeoff, and I think the takeoff out the second corner was this step up, and it was like the takeoff was about ten foot high. Um, the gap was about you know six or seven meters long, but the actual landing stepped up four meters from the takeoff so you can imagine this landing they wanted the, the the actual track designers wanted it to look like um the the mountain that's there um 
What's the, what famous, the, mountain ma- what's the famous mountain in um, Rio? Like the... Close to the Demon Mountain. Thing. No, no, the other one, which Sugar, is shaped like... Oh, Sugarloaf. Sugar. 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 Ah, Sugarloaf. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. So they wanted the track to were have... The, were they actually BMX track designers, though? Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, right, okay. well, yeah, not very good ones, but they were, <laughs> yeah. Um, which they had the same issue in London when they built the track, hence why Clark and Ken, who are my sponsors, they had to... They literally, before the Olympics in London, they came in and they rebuilt the track because the first person was terrible but then they still got the first person back in for the, uh, for real so oh, wow. it's mental but they always wanted something from the like from the city or wherever the games the being held. On it or yeah so like the women in london had the underground jump um which was meant to be like the london underground um and then in rio was meant to be the um sugarloaf mountain yeah and that jump was a mountain i mean <laughs> i mean you can imagine it it's like a 10 foot takeoff and then four meters higher of that the landing so i mean this landing was it was the height of like you know the the the, the windows and the top, top floor of a house it was really, nuts really. and it was like super steep it was super steep there's no way like no one was even looking at well, you're, you're just going vertical and then coming back down because it's so steep yeah yeah to the point of I, I shit you not we had the the takeoff and it went flat and then to the landing they had steps for the marshals to walk oh, up it. So they had dug steps into the landing. So it was like full on, and they dug full steps all the way up to the landing, just in, like, I don't know for what reason, probably That's because they knew there was going to be some crashes, but nobody yeah. sent it, so. Pretty similar to the velodrome. You need to get some steps out if you want to fix the track. Yeah, you do. We face similar issues. Yeah. I mean, like, this is the issue. same sport, isn't it? This is why I hate <laughs> training with the BMXs, because... <laughs> Because they always just they always have something to like beat you on. So it's like what heat power, <laughs> cadence, anything like that. And when it comes to the track, we're like, oh, I really hate like so personally I don't like Hong Kong truck Belgium. What's it, wrong about that? Because it throws it, it, it like in turn one and two, it sucks you in and then throws you back out. So as you're correcting, you have, you end up correcting the long way and then you end up up at the blue. It's a nightmare. But then these guys come along and they're like, Oh well, there's a vertical yeah, jump and everyone died and it's like, Oh like, okay, fair enough. Yeah, we so ju- what, what we just have <laughs> issues after issues after issues. It seems like and well, what's wrong with the um, European track then? Um, um, from my opinion, not too much. Uh, there was a few tweaks. Like the third straight was at th- at first, it was very like deep. Um, I mean, to explain to the listeners, it's yeah, like we class like technical straights as really tight um, between each like roller or double. For example, we it's really deep, long rolling, but these were quite sharp and, and still very deep. So for you to go at it like a full on race pace with seven other guys next to you, to actually uh, like make sure, basically it's very unforgiving. If you made a mistake, chances of you hitting the deck and hurting yourself was highly likely, you know, so. And hurting yourself means pretty much breaking bones, doesn't it? Yeah, most of the time. I mean, you, you get you get lucky sometimes, but yeah, most of the time you break a bone and, and from that, yeah. <laughs> there's, there's, been, there's been some pretty embarrassing injuries on the British oh, Cycling BMX I mean, team. Terrible. I, mean, I don't mean uh, bad, I mean embarrassing. But, oh yeah, there's definitely been embarrassing <laughs> ones. There's definitely, uh, <laughs> Trey will not appreciate that comment. <laughs> uh, but no, like, just in general, I think since I came on the program like nine, eight, nine years ago as a full-time athlete, we have trained as a full squad about six times. Hmm. And I think that's like, yeah, apart from that, there's always been one person or two people injured the whole time. And it's like, that's mental to think of, yeah, eight to nine years of training in a full squad. So going back to Glasgow, I guess it was really important for you to get out in front because there, w- there were a few spills behind you. Yeah, yeah. Like, well, like, not that seem to affect the race, but like... <laughs> It, it it didn't it didn't see, that's why what you were saying it wasn't very forgiving. Yeah, it just wasn't forgiving, and I mean, yeah, as I say, no one had really ridden it. We didn't get time on the track beforehand, so so that was another thing. Which obviously, when there's always a home race, having a home track advantage is always nice. But to be denied the the opportunity to go and ride the track and get practice and hours on the track over our competition would have been really nice. But we didn't get that, so. So we got the and and looking back, like we we turned up for practice the first day, and like everything went so perfect. Like my starts were on point, riding the track so well. Like nobody beat me at the start that day, and I was like, and straight away then I was like, oh boy, this is like this is my race. I'm feeling good. This yeah. this is my basically. I'm gonna take this home. We don't really know what that is. Um, <laughs> Every single pre race day we've ever had has been a total disaster. Yeah, yeah. We we don't seem to train well, do we? Oh, like it's pre race day. We train okay, day. but pre race day is just for some reason or another it just yeah, like it always goes wrong. But it's because there's a lot of stress on the track. 
like there are like 50 people trying to do the same thing and you're just panicking trying not to be hit by another rider so but you probably have the same uh I yeah your 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 racing can get pretty hectic we just get because they've, every track's different some tracks favor other riders you know everyone in bmx has there's so many different elements and skills to each track each style is pretty much slightly different um who, who are the dodgy nations out there when it comes to track taxes what as in like gonna make you crash yeah. or kind of or just getting in the way like so in track cycling there'll always be some guy from azerbaijan who insists on riding like on the blue or the black for the entirety of the training session. <laughs> so if, you, if you're doing like a three up team sprint, like there's this guy just thundering down the entire time. It's like he's trying to get road miles in. I don't understand. Yeah. <laughs> and like, yeah, it's just carnage. Like the number of times that I've like everyone, if you, if you want to have some entertainment, the best time to come and watch track cycling, this probably isn't a great advert for track cycling, but the best time to come watch track cycling is in the practice sessions. Cause you'll see so many near misses and yeah. sometimes some really bad crashes. You're fearing for your life sometimes, don't you? Like just looking around everywhere, trying. You know what, Phil? It's almost more dangerous people. than BMX, you'd say. Oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, as I say, I don't really, I couldn't say there's an actual country because we we don't have like we just have um, so you're amateur, junior, elite, you know. So as soon as you turn 17, going 18, you turn elite. So we don't have no under 23 Europeans or worlds like you guys mm. have on the track side. So so for us, it's normally the the younger guys that are literally just stepping into the elite class. Um, and when we go to races, you normally only get to between 40, 40 minutes and an hour's practice. So, so to go to them events and actually, you know, get the track dialed, have good starts, make sure you're race ready. It's actually quite a rush. And it's them younger guys that, you know, they get out on track, they do the warm up before and then they get on track and then it's just literally full ball mm. and they've never done this stuff before. So it's kind of like, I guess, you know, emotions, they're a bit panicky. They, they want to try and do the best. They're on the gate with some of the best in the world think all that in in itself and then before you know it there's always a an explosion of a few sketchy younger riders yeah. but i think it's just a learning curve you know until they get that experience of getting on the gate with the bigger guys um turning up at these events more more often and and then as that seems to progress and they just get older they just seem to start to get comfortable so and getting that it, zone. it's just a bit funnier for us because i think like sometimes you can just it seems to be an assumption that you can show up to a track race and have no experience at all like i remember at delhi 2010 commonwealth games like um, obviously it was a in India was hosting it, so they thought we're putting in an Indian track team, and uh, I, I honestly don't think any of them had done a velodrome before. Like they were shaling bikes, shaling helmets, and all that kind of stuff. And one of them, one of them took out Coach Kev, we were talking about earlier. <laughs> it was a guy called Prince High Lame, and uh, I was watching it. Was back. he an actual Prince, or was uh, it, what's his name, Prince? No, on the board it said Prince High Lame. I don't know if he was an actual Prince. I didn't ask him. Prince High Lame, if you're by any chance, if you're listening to this <laughs> now, please write in and tell us if you're an actual prince. Um, but anyway, so like he he went round uh, and Kev, Stru this was probably Kev Stewart's last competitive race, and it was the funniest. Like he doesn't, he still doesn't find it funny, but it's the funniest thing ever. So like, <laughs> for some reason, this is back when you could pick. You didn't have to. So in Keelan now, if you're given slot one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, you have to roll off in that order. But back then, you could fight quite early on, or you could just skip past him. But for some reason, Kev thought, Prince I lame, that's a good wheel to follow. <laughs> I'll sit behind this guy on, oh on, on spokes and on an aluminium bike, because <laughs> I believe in the Prince. <laughs> so he was, he was following him, and then, and then Prince I lame's chain fell off, oh, like no. after, after the first lap. <laughs> and Kev gets taken way off the back. And if you, if you haven't seen Keelan, there's like three warm-up laps where there's a motorbike and it just brings them up to pace very slowly and then it, and then it's fastest cross the line wins basically. So there's three laps that are dead easy and that should be the easiest bit of the race because it's just slowly bringing you up to pace, getting the race up and going. Um, so Kev gets dropped. He gets dropped by the motorbike. And then because you're looking on the camera, the camera obviously, it can only focus on so many people. So I remember watching it in the village and you'd see the shot and you'd see like the Dern Eagle Pie, Rider 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And then just as the camera's about to change, you'd see Kev pop into shot as he was trying as hard as he could to get back on. And we all were just sitting back in, in the team house, like bawling with laughter because all you saw for like two minutes as this bike warmed up was like Kev just come into shot as hard as he possibly could into every corner trying to trying to make up the lost ground that he had on Prince Island. I guess if people turn up like this to a big mixed race, they'd well, they're probably, gonna get hurt. Yeah, they get well, hurt. They hurt yeah, themselves, well, they just they? won't be able to race, you know, they won't be able to compete. I mean... Doesn't stop uh, them trying. Though, but we had we had the world champs in uh, Azerbaijan this year, yeah. and Azerbaijan had a rider in the elite class, and it was actually amazing to see because this this guy, um, he wasn't very skilled, probably very new to the sport, you know, 
Um, I wouldn't like to say what age he was, but he was he was definitely older generation, you know, like 27, 28, maybe even 30. And um, he he couldn't really ride, the, he couldn't get through the track. He couldn't jump the pro sections and things, but the turnout for him and the crowd <laughs> was wild. I kid you not, he was on the gate and it was like, the commentator would be like, I'm from Azerbaijan. And the crowd was like going nuts. Like the biggest show, like the biggest... Um, Oh, that's good. Cheers actually. for that one guy. And it was actually amazing. Well, the fact of when... Sometimes it's a bit more about the story than it is about the leader, I think, a lot of the time. It's probably looked a bit like Kian and Mario on a mountain bike trail. <laughs> 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 you would okay. not appreciate I've this. Seen, you would not I, appreciate I've that. I've seen Kian and Mario do go-karting. So uh, if he's anything like he was... Uh, he, he can't hold a slide. Like, oh. he genuinely can't. So, you know, a, uh, anyone who's been on a go-kart track knows that it slides and you have to try and hold it as you go down the corner. Like, if you're just having a bit spins, of fun. Yeah. He just spins every turn. So, like, you come down flying flying down then you just see Kian and Maddie facing the wrong way looking at you like <laughs> please don't hit me you please spot them eyebrows me. as well through, <laughs> through the visor <laughs> just two eyebrows like <laughs> <laughs> but, um, anyway so I, I guess in BMX though you got it seems like a lot of the time you got two mindsets so in Glasgow you got off the front nice and clean got to the bottom of the lamp first which seems to be like one of the key points because that keeps you out of trouble yeah, we, we focus pretty much predominantly on, you know, getting out the start, getting to that first first corner first. If you can get the, you know, you've probably got a 90, 95% chance of winning the actual race because mm. you can, can you can pick any line you want. You can do, you've got a clear track in front of you and you can control the pace of the race. Um, Which is um, like the perfect gate line to pick. Um, like I mean, I mean, it's random, well, isn't it? Or does it? Well, it goes off. You can, um, you can choose off. whoever is the fastest. In qualifying, yeah, whoever's so. fastest in qualifying. So for every t- so once you finish your third motor or qualifying round, your lap time then goes and sets you into your seed for what pick you'd get for the quarterfinal. Okay. Um, and then same from quarterfinal result into semi-final, semi-final into final. Um, so that's how it works for us. And so ob- uh, obviously in Glasgow you had that good mindset. You made the corner first, and you're like. I've got this basically. Well, this is the thing. Like, uh, it's well, as I say, it was it was a whole whirlwind of a ride for that that whole event because the first day went so well, and then the second day in qualifying, I actually turned up and I could not do my starts. Like, I was hitting the gate every time. I was either wheeling or hitting the gate, uh, making really silly mistakes on the track, and I was just a little bit frustrated. And literally overnight, well, from one day, from a perfect practice straight through to you know qualifying my mindset had changed from being like on cloud nine to literally rock bottom to the point of where i was like what's happened like where's my form gone like i can't do a start i can't do anything and i had my pretty much my biggest competition of that whole weekend which was david graff from switzerland in my qualifying heat and he pretty much hand like he handed my ass to me you know he literally like i couldn't get close to him he was just gone all day and I, I, pretty, I think I got a second in, uh, I think I got a third in the first race. I won the second one and then I got a second to him in the third one and he cut me off big time in the third one. So we was on the gate next to each other and I was thinking, oh, well, yeah, you just want to make the finals pretty well. I don't want to crash now because I know I'm qualified. So I'm pretty thinking, I'm just thinking, right, get out, go straight and just, if I'm in second, just follow him home and like second pedal, he came over on me, hit the elbow and he did a savage cut off. And I remember from that point being like, whoa, like he did that to send a message to me, you know, because yeah. obviously he knows I'm going, I'm going well. Um, I'm potentially his biggest competition. Then he knew I was going well. He knew. So it was like, yeah, that think, was a message. I think that's something that people don't realize at home when you're watching a, a sporting event with a qualifying section in it is like in sprint, especially if you qualify 15th, 18th, 19th. The hardest round so at the beginning. Yeah. And you just, you just think, I've got an entire, I've got an entire day of racing and I'm trapped. <laughs> it's like, it's going to be like really hard from the first round. I mean, you know what that's like, Phil. I know what it's like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then if you qualify first, it's like, it's almost like easy street for that's the first, it, yeah. first few rounds. Okay. Yeah. So we get to the final. Yeah. So then the finals day, um, kind of just, yeah, starts in practice. First start, started terrible again, hit the gate. But then as the day went on, just managed to like really you know, get control of my thoughts, my process, what I actually needed to do, stop thinking emotionally and literally just every start, every lap got better and better. And then, yeah, I think I won the eights, won the quarter, won the semi. Kai had a faster time than me in the semi. So he had first pick, I had second pick, David third. 
Um, and then going on to the gate was actually quite quite interesting because I mean, David's got third pick. He's on the outside of me. So straight away he's thinking, well, I can cut Carl off easy. No problem. Did it in practice to him. I'm thinking, David cut me off in practice quite easy. And then as well, Kai, I've heard Kai say in the team area, oh, I'm definitely going lane one because Kev's a good starter. He'll protect me. And then I'm like, okay. So basically I'm like, well, Kai's hoping I'm going to protect him the whole way into turn one. And this guy thinks he's going to cut me off, you know. Um, but managed to just get out really well. Um, got out just like pretty much the same as David. He had a little bit more than me over the first jump, went in front. But then I just kept charging, kept charging, and then led it from there. And yeah, come across the line and was just like made up. Just I remember coming across the line. Actually, as I came across the line, my family don't come to any European races often. They don't, like my dad doesn't have a passport. I've got quite a big like sibling family. So, um, they, but they was all there. So literally as I came over the line, I looked up at the first straight where my family was. And then was, I remember like, you'll watch the video back now. And I was like, Woo-hoo-hoo. Like, <laughs> I don't know why I did that, but it just kind of came out, you know? And, it just, and it, yeah. Like I look back at the Olympic video and I think that's a bit embarrassing. <laughs> like you're just so happy. Like, I don't know. I don't think you realize what you actually do. Like, I think at the time you think it's really cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think that's the thing. Whatever you decide to do, you're like, and then you watch the video back and you're like, God, that is crazy as <laughs> like, I would never do that in my day-to-day life. But that, but that was a good day for the program. That was a one-two, basically. Yeah, it was a very good day for the program. I think that was, again, something that really, for us in the program, um, stood out again because I remember we, we went into the World Champs, you know, like two and a half months earlier than that and um, we had the French coach PH come in and and it was there was a lot of you know um, uncertainties about our funding level how much funding we're getting what races we're going to be able to go to Um, yeah you know I could bore you for hours with it all but it just really seemed very uncertain of what direction the program was going in and Liam Phillips um, retired as well and right? Liam retired so then it was kind of like I'll be honest from my perspective looking in as a rider and the information that I was getting I was actually honestly thinking oh they, they want to get rid of the program like I don't think they see a future in, in BMX to, to um, on a slightly different point sometimes when we're loading back on Kingsway remember if we'd, if we'd if we'd had a series of really bad results you'd always pass Aldi and they would say like come and join us as a checkout assistant <laughs> and you'll get £28,000 a year. And we're like, wow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, I'll start yeah. snatching the hands off of it. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But no, so obviously it meant a lot to you because pro- because like, I mean, right. uh, like, to be fair, which I'm going to come on to in a minute, like as a programme, you guys have to work within the British cycling system. Like one, mm-hmm. of, one of the most successful teams, cycling teams in the world. And uh, to, get, to get a result in BMX means a lot. Yeah, yeah, because like Liam really was the one that was just getting all the results, you know, and I guess he was in a way keeping the program alive. And then with him retiring, it was kind of left down to like me, Trey, Quillen, and then Kai and Paddy uh, not long after got brought onto the program. So, yeah, when I obviously made the world main and, and got sick, um, yeah, I literally came across the line. I remember the boys just looking at me and they were just like, oh, you've saved the program pretty much, like without that result of me making a final, we really that year, or well, since Liam retired, we didn't really have a leg to stand on to, you know, to go back to British Cycling and UK Sport and say, look, there is still lots of positives within this team. There's a lot of progress being made and we're actually so close to to to, to delivering, you know, the programme with, with medals, not only in track and road and but with with a BMX medal, you know, uh, so because the lighting was kind of slowly in the walks. Remember, they they kind of got rid of the women's team. There was a lot of upset with the coaches, Liam, obviously the tiring and stuff like that. Like it, it like for me personally, I, I I was thinking the same thing probably as you as a little bit as like this is a good time for this as a but then yeah, but then you need to compare it to the track program. It's such a gamble to win an extra world championships in BMXing because it's like anything can happen there. Mm. Like you get taken out, can't but be your fault. Do, do, I do, think, do, do I you think love that random aspect or do you, um, because not, like, th- I mean, we love it. I, like a, I love it as a sport and I think it's amazing and it does make the sport really exciting. But I think one thing which you guys get within track cycling is you have a lot more control over the controllables. Um, and for us in BMX, cause I think, as you say, crashes can happen. Um, and I think just as well, it's not just about, you know, you can be the fastest man on the day at, the, at that race and you still probably won't win. You know, it's, it's, it's just one of those, one of those events, one, one of that. Yeah. It's well, one, one mistake and, yeah. and, and, and you're out of it, you know? So 
Um, BMX, you do need a little bit of luck on your side. You need to perform, obviously, high. You need to train well. You need to have a good preparation into the race and be confident and have the right mindset and deliver everything you've got in the tank. But at the end of the day, you can only do as good as, as you can do. And if the person next to you, you know, th there was a race in Argentina last year, went to a World Cup, um, and in, I think it was in the quarterfinal. I did a perfect start and it was a really stacked race. Um, I did a perfect start, perfect first straight, still went out. But the two guys either side of me was one was a Russian lad and one was the world champ, Silvan Andre. And they both did, like we all did perfect starts, but their perfect starts were better than my perfect start. So I can't get to the end of the race and, you know, throw my helmet on the floor and be like, ah, ah. Because at the end of the day, I delivered everything I could do. And I knew deep down that I delivered everything I could do. So I could actually walk away from the race with my head held high, just knowing that I've got more work to do. Um, so so that, that kind of leads us on to our next questions. Because every, everyone looks to, you know, when, when you speak to people at dinners or anything like that, they always, they always presume that British cycling wins everything because they do well at the Olympic Games. Um, and then I kind of say, well, it's not quite that way. Like, especially for the spinners, we, we struggle all the way to the games and then for whatever reason, it, it kind of comes together. But for, for BMX, I guess the question is, do you, so it's a bit of a two-part. It's first of all, do you think we'll see an Olympic medal from the British team? And then also, why do you think we've been unlucky or missed out on Olympic medals so far? Um... I'll answer the first question. Um, yeah, we will. I'm pretty confident one of us will get a medal, you know. Um, myself, Kai. Uh, well, really, the whole squad, actually. I'm not going to single anyone out. Myself, Kai, Trey, Quillen, Paddy. Um, there's, we've there's, all there's got... Been, we've all there's been, like, big hopes. Uh, like, if you think about 2008, we had Shanae's uh, t uh, and Liam was just kind of coming up through there. 2012, Shanae's and Liam. Yeah. Um, you know, 2016... We had two male entrants there as well. Yeah, with you there as well. And like it, it will. I'm, I'm pretty certain it will. We just got to keep chipping away at it, you know. And, and I think it's obviously the Olympics is once every four years, you know. And I think a lot of the time, um, and certain with like certainly with like how the program is medal and often, you know, that's that's the philosophy since 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 Dave B and Shane was around. So, so for us every time we've been to Olympics and we've not been successful, it's kind of like, oh, well, you've not been successful, but look at all the world champs and the European champs or the World Cup seasons, like leading from them, through them Olympic cycles. We've actually won like a lot of races. We've done really well at world championships. We've, we've medaled, we've made finals, you know. Got which, jerseys, which, yeah. Yeah, got jerseys, which shows we've obviously got a good amount of talent and depth within the program to, to go and achieve Olympic success. But at the end of the day, it's one race every four years, you know, if you run them Olympic finals over 10 times, chances are every, like you'll have every, for every 10 races, you would have a different result in every single one of those, you know, yeah. it's like more, more and even more so in BMX, you know, it's, it's one of them sports. So I think for sure, for sure, I'm com very confident within the program, myself and the team, that we will get an Olympic medal. I'm certain of it. Um, and you think the, the setup you've got at the moment is, 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 is going to help you in that pursuit, I guess? Um, it's definitely, like, without it, we'd be we'd be stuck. Mm. We wouldn't be able to perform. We wouldn't be able to train every day. We well, I don't know. It seems like there's a few more options with BMX. Like, I feel like America is the equivalent to Japan as it is for sprinters. So, like, we've got Joe Truman out there at the moment. You can be professional in Japan, make a living as a Kirin well, you rider. Need, yeah, you need to be able to speak Japanese if you really want to become a Japanese Kirin But rider, he, he can make a good amount of money out there. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. it's probably the same for you guys in America. And then there's a few yeah. options about going to Switzerland and stuff like that, you know. Yeah, it's just, I guess it's just one of those. I mean, it's it's a little bit sad, like BMX at the moment is in a very, it's a very strange place at the moment, you know. Um, certainly on the American side of things. Um, so the USA BMX, they've actually took a lot of the funding away from, from prize winnings for the elite guys. So no um, more big checks on the podiums? Yeah, not as much. Okay. Um, to the, well, to be honest, I'll, I'll give you the, the fact. I mean, there was a Swiss, Swiss guy, um, Simon Marquette, he went out to America like two months ago, went there, he made the final both days, got on the podium one day, and he still came out of it like um, 800 euro, like negative, basically. And, was, and that wouldn't have been the case five years ago? Ah, uh, no, nah, with them results, he would have been really good. And at the end of it, because he's obviously paying for himself to get over to these events to, to race the American guys and race on the American circuit with, with the world's best. And, and he come out of it, you know, 800 euro down. So he's like, well, what's the point of doing that, spending all that money when... I can race in Europe where 
six of the eight best riders in the world are already are currently from Europe and it's better prize money. It's cheaper for me to get to and so potentially could make more money, you know. And it, and also, um, bike companies with around the world, we just seem to have so many bike companies at the moment rather than how back in the, the 80s, 90s when we had, you know, you had your GT, your Mongoose, your... I had a GT. Your, you know, you like you I had think. you had a you had a, <laughs> you had a few big bike companies which were building frames and having factory riders and being able to and then they was in a position to actually look at BMX riders and say, you know what, you're showing good talent. We want you to represent our bike brand, bike brand, and we will pay you X amount. You know, whether that was fifty, sixty grand a year. Nowadays, like riders are struggling to just bring like five five grand you know so so where's the pressure coming from is it is it does it goes does it go back to that the olympic question where they want to see more extreme lighting is, is that where the pressure is coming is it esports is it philip hines setting the track on fire and people watching that like what like what where, where do you think the attention's swerving to no i think the attention is fantastic within the sport but i think there's just so many bike companies out there now that there's so much to choose from so yeah. no certainly within bmx there's no one like there's not a couple of companies anymore which are selling loads of bike like you go to a bmx race now every kid has a different brand bike you know they've got you've got gts haros pures stay strongs you know um we are whizzes they have all these random bikes which most of them you've never even seen or heard of before and because there's so many of them Probably selling no. quite cheap as well because yeah, they're the selling them. They're, they're, they're so being made something. in Taiwan, pretty cheap, you know. Um, so they're being mass produced, very cheap, and it's easy to get hold of hold of them. These bigger companies now, which used to have these big budgets, are not selling as many bikes. So then it's like, well, why? I, I guess they look at it in the terms of they're just they want profit at the end of the day, don't they? So they look at it as right. Well, we're not selling as many bikes. Well, we can't offer as much like money towards you know we don't invest as much money back towards the sport so so yeah I, that's what i think the biggest issue is is the actual bike companies so no like myself you're looking you're constantly looking outside sports you know to try like outside of the sport to kind of bring sponsorship in and get money and it and it's tough like i think it's for all of us that even in track sprinting we can't even have bikes th there's, there's so much on tv though as well though it's like um you know women women's sport is getting massive and that's a great thing esports are getting massive mm. drone sports more extreme sports mm. the x games like it's 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 such a compar it's such a competitive market out there for for any sport to survive and it kind of needs to I feel anyway, it needs to kind of keep with the times in order to keep the audience in there. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, like, yeah, I mean, you look at the, the BMX as, as a whole and at the Olympics, um, I'm pretty like from the last Olympics, I believe BMX was one of the first events to actually sell out on tickets. So, oh, really? so yeah, that's, that's, that's the, the Azerbaijan uh, guy. Uh, <laughs> no, <not> quite, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Hopefully he makes it the next one and the, the whole stadium sold out just for him. So, uh, but no, like I believe, yeah, when soon as tickets went on sale, the first the first tickets that were one of the first um, events to be sold up. And, and in was, Brazil, was it's not a big sport particularly. No, nah, not, not, not at all. So, so for that to happen, I think that shows how much people are actually interested in the sport and actually enjoy watching the sport, you know. Um, so it's a shame that we don't actually have, you know, these big outside sponsors, companies, because, yeah, we're on BMX, we're a little bit, um, I guess we're a little bit more free than you guys, you know, you get tied into the program, you have to wear, you know, the kit, the Cervellos, um, laser helmets, but for us, we don't, we, we get to choose our own okay, helmets, we, we have our own race bands, apart from the jersey, pretty much everything else is... So, can actually make a bit of money so we riding. can make a little bit of money, you know, riding yeah. from components from other bike companies, frames. We can we can run whichever pants we want with whichever logos down the side, you know. Same with the helmets, gloves, eyewear, wrist braces, um, it's things like that. So we do do we do get a bit of allowance to, you know, to a, to rebrand ourselves as such compared to you guys on the track. Yeah. But but again, we're still very hard and competitive out there to kind of what makes you stand out more than everyone else sure. and 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 at the end of the day like any company what what do you bring to the table to What's actually the return, yeah. yeah like what if i'm going to give you ten thousand pound yeah. what you're going to give me in return and you're like oh well i can you know um, there's a <laughs> few yeah instagram i've got this many followers on instagram i can do you buy your followers yeah so it's like yeah you do no i don't buy <laughs> you, slip, you slip that in while i was answering uh, um because that's a good question because like, i think a lot of, i remember back in the day like phil would wind up liam no end because he'd be like why don't you have disc wheels why don't you why don't you wear some lycra why don't you do yeah. this and do that like what what do you think bmx is it because the rules are so restrictive or is the culture quite against any kind of innovation in there because for you guys 
like the, the big advance always seems to come from like the bailings. Like I've been in the mechanics workshop again and again, and you guys are just going on the bailings, going, man, look at that, that's smooth. I mean, we always want it. we take power to weight uh, ratio into account. We're sprinters, just like you guys, you know, aerodynamics to an extent. Um, to a certain point, we take. What's that. your highest peak power? I actually don't really what on what bike or any oh no uh, what, no no because what bike's a bit unreliable. I don't that's that's what bike maybe, maybe what bike unreliable. wants to sponsor the podcast so maybe what bike do want to, I hear their new bike is much better but their yeah. old bike can be out by a couple hundred watts either way. Well, we don't really actually test power that often compared to what we used to. I mean, I think, I, th- I think in, in, in the in the lab um, it's been like two two so nothing yeah. like absolutely crazy. But Qu- Quillen hit like two seven. Is yeah, Quill- Quillen's a is strong he, boy. The maddest is thing he? is, Quillen's a big, strong boy. Too strong. And he puts out, like, really good watts out on a watt bag, and then you put him on a BMX <laughs> bag, and he doesn't seem to put the same amount of watts out. I don't well, that's like, the argument of, like, static versus dynamic, isn't it? Hundred, like, he, yeah. as a static person, he puts out, like, huge amounts of watts. Which I feel down but with. Then, but then, like, literally, we have, I mean, on the timing system in Manchester, we've got a sprint straight. We have a starting block from zero to 60 metres, and we have a, a timing loop at... 10 20 30 45 60 meters and he and like we i can do a sprint and he can do a sprint but somehow i'll be you know uh, i'll be four four hundred faster you know and it's like how can i be four hundred faster which but i'm putting out you know 600 watts less 500 watts less it's like so yeah i guess it's how you can turn it out on a bike which mm, is moving it's a big difference I, th- I think that maybe that, that, that comes back to the Olympic question a little bit because I think we get a big lift from having that ALO package come through, um, having the new bikes, having all that kind of stuff. We usually just pull it out just before the Olympic Games and a lot of other nations do as well with you know New Zealand, Australia, all that kind of stuff. And, and the Germans kind of started that trend. Um, but I guess you'll be riding more or less the same bike all year round, same kit. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, it's it's... Every rider, as I say, they're very unique in the riding style, the bike setup, everything. So each rider will constantly spend hours finding out what works for them best, you know, which which frame they they feel more comfortable on. You know, every frame is pretty much different. Some have higher bottom brackets, longer back ends, shorter back ends. You can go on for hours, you know, like different rakes and, and, and how it's, much... It's, uh, yeah, it's a lot like about much, for Yeah, a lot about like the headset rake and, and stuff like that and... There's so much into it. How where do you have your bars and how high do you have your bars? It, you can go on for hours, you know. But I think once you fine tune that and the rider finds what's comfortable for them, they that's once they like they grab a hold of that and they make the most of everything they can. Like you say, the burrings. Like once a week, you know, I I go to the mechanics, I get the Chris King tool, I smash the burrings out. Half the time when I take the burrings out, they're still clean because they've only been used like two or three times. But just my own for my own mindset just to make sure like a one if I keep cleaning it and keep on top of it it lasts longer for one yeah, two it, it yeah. runs better and three I just feel so much more mentally confident knowing that I'm it's highly unlikely that I'm going to have a mechanical you know so would you still put yourself down as a bit of like an innovator so I know like Liam spent a lot of time with was it like Rob Hales and down at the metal shop and all that kind of stuff trying to come out with new ways to he was always working on this bike when I was yeah. living with him so yeah like yeah, or, or somebody uh, who's not interested, or do you have to be interested? Nah, yeah, I think you have to be interested into it. Yeah, I think you've got to be, to some extent, mechanically minded. You know, um, for me, Phil's very mechanically minded. <laughs> very, yeah. yeah. <laughs> 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 Mate, honestly, we, we did a vlog. Of, well, I mentioned this in the last podcast, but I'll bring it up again. Um, did you listen to the last podcast? Actually, I've not. You see, I've, you've not been made accessible for me. That's terrible. And actually, to you be should honest, have done your research. I, you I, had no I, idea I, what you're coming into. Here. And <laughs> I didn't. I didn't. But I trusted you both because okay, you're yeah. ex-teammates. And uh, well, one's ex. <laughs> I think you're doing a lot better than and, us. And and and, and Phil podcast. and Phil just went. Nah, it wasn't that great. Um, we're hoping <laughs> yours is going to be better. So, <laughs> so I was just like, oh, okay. Right, <laughs> right, so w- once yeah. we did a vlog, and I was like, Phil, you want to talk me through the bike? And I was like. What tires are you riding, Phil? And we've ridden the same tires. I bet he said like rubber. He had no idea. He had no idea. <laughs> and like we've we've ridden the same tires we, since no, two thousand eight. The, the tires had a certain thread or tread, whatever you call it, on it. And Kellen was very specific about it. And I don't have a clue what it's <laughs> what it is. Yeah, do you I take your bailings out every every weekend? Do you? No. <laughs> See, this is the other thing. Like the people, thing, yeah, we, people we have, have go on. Sorry, we we have mechanics working on our on our track bikes like um, all the time and we, we, we have that trust i guess with we, we aren't really allowed to like do anything with it not like clean the bearings or anything so see that's the thing like I, I, obviously i've spent a lot of time 
in the mechanics workshop and I've spoke to the guys and then I get on with everyone in there really, really well. Cause as I say, I spend hours and hours in the, um, using the tools on the setup and everything. And, and I've always said like, if I was to go to track, like f if I decide I'm going to take up track cycling at the end of my BMX career and, and see where that road takes me, um, I couldn't not imagine myself, you know, I understand the program would be giving me a track bike and, and they would be, that would be my tool. And they're, they're so used to, as you say, you, yourself having somebody set it up. And I couldn't, I couldn't not see myself like looking at my track bike and going, I want to try and make that faster. And then say with the Tour de France guys or like the endurance guys, like they, sometimes they get honed into a specific mechanic or something like that. Like, like, or Cav or something like that. He's like, you know, you want your bike set up by a certain mm. person. Like, so even if you're at the top of the sport, it's your bike and you're going to work in it. Yeah, well, for me, I, like, I just see it as the end of the day, like we don't have, it's very rare that we always have a mechanic at the race, like normally big races, world champs, European champs. Uh, we started getting getting a mechanic at the World Cups. Um, but before that, we've never had someone come away with us. So if the bike broke at trackside, who's got to fix it? Yourself, as quick as you can. How you know? would you manage? Show you Ernie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ask the coach. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, so yeah, we've always had, we've almost always, like, I guess in a way we've been, like, that, that, that responsibility has been pressed up on us, you know? It's been like, right, this is kind of what you've got to do. So it kind of, and, and for myself, like with my dad, my dad was a motorbike mechanic as soon as he left school. So as a kid, I was always around bikes, learning about, like, taking motorbikes apart, putting engines back together, you know, whether it was tinkering on the car, tinkering on the BMX bikes, mountain bikes, it was always something that I did through my whole childhood. So yeah. for me, it's second nature, like to have a spanner, spanner in my hand and look at something and go, right, like something's not right though. It doesn't sound right. It doesn't feel right. How can I make that better? That for me is like, I absolutely love it. I don't, I can, I can spend five, six, seven hours in the mechanics workshop and the time's flown by and it doesn't feel like a chore. Mm. But like, for example, someone like Trey, who's on the program, he's not as mechanically minded. He hates doing his bike, you know, to the point of where sometimes he looks at me and goes, Kev, I'll give you a tenner to do my bike. <laughs> <laughs> where, like, uh, people Does think, he pay out though? Oh, he'll pay out. Or like, oh, okay, that's new, isn't it, Phil? He, he, actually, said, he actually said to me today, because um, we're going to Belgium tomorrow and he's having a bit of brake issue. And he rang me up and he said, Yo, bro. Um, yeah, I'm gonna get to Belgium, but I've had a little break issue. Do you think you could have a look and fix it for me? I was like, uh, "What do I get out of it?" And he was like, "Buy you a coffee." I was like, <laughs> <laughs> "Okay, yeah, I'll I'll take that." So, because Phil actually still uh, still owes Kian forty euros from our weekend in Berlin. <sighs> Come on, Phil. Pay I, was, uh, I thought I had better form than um, he's not a Lannister. You know. Well, no, he? he got he got into Berlin and he, he he laid down the gauntlet. So basically, we went there for the nightlife. I felt good for the first two or three drinks. We went there for the nightlife and he was like, Kian, drinking, fear drinking, I will match you. I 100% guarantee I'll match you. And Kian, <laughs> and Kian was like, okay, how much? And he's like, 20 euro, mate. Every night, I will destroy you. <laughs> I, I forgot that Kian actually goes to like, until he's not, not standing up anymore. So, what's a terrible mistake? <laughs> and I lost. And he's a big boy. He's a big boy. Uh, he's not as big anymore, not as actually. Big anymore, is he? He, he was it. Well, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. I feel really sorry saying this because I used to look at Kian when I first came on the program. His Beyonce like, booty, and I was like, oh, Kian, you were like one hell of a man. You know what I mean? What a he, specimen! He was a good specimen of a man, and now he's like, <laughs> now he's like a shell of his own self. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, anyway, we'll get Kian on one day, I'm sure. One day. We love you, Kian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, yeah, we do. If you want the video, this, yeah. we do. it doesn't. It, he would never get this far. Oh, would he not? No, yeah, he'd, he'd be he'd, bored. Yeah, I think some. I think actually, genuinely, these days, he's heard so much of us talking shit. He's just had enough. <laughs> like he, didn't, like he, he likes to leave it like a just month apart. Yeah, he would have got angry. <laughs> he does get angry yeah. early on. Um, all right, cool. So you sponsored by a wrist brace company. Mm -hmm. um, why is that? Um, just too many crashes. Way too many crashes. You know, since being talk us through the the bones. Um, yeah, so eight wrist surgeries, four on each, um, six of them done by Mike Hayton, um, two of them while I was awake as well. So that was interesting. Um, how did, how did, what well, is it not with, with any pain relief? Just uh, with, local? with just local. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, um, but can you, so if you, so I, I've had my collarbone done and I, I made the mistake of, of Googling like what it actually looks like to have your collarbone plated. Mm -hmm. And those guys, th they're gruesome. Like, yeah, they, well, how did you break your collarbone, Callum? <laughs> it was an accident. <laughs> 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 um, basically, I was trying to show off and then I fell off. Anyway, <laughs> the tire of the old, 
the tire split apart. I will not say the name of the tire in case they sponsored us. But they're Italian and they lime with. What do they lime with? I'm not sure. Um, Italian. Italian. Company. Is it like Otto, Otti or something like that? No, no, that's a nutrition company. Oti. Oh, is it? Oh, <laughs> okay. No, anyway, so the tire of the old and that was a disaster. Anyway, um, what were we talking about? Um, having your collarbone done. Having my collarbone. Yeah, so I made the mistake of YouTubing it and those guys are like, they don't, it's, it's not like watching heart surgery where it's like, you know, keyhole surgery and they take it really gentle. Those, those guys, they get the hacksaws out and the sledgehammers. Well, Mike Hayton tricked me. I mean, I've had quite a lot of surgeries, you know, I've had a lot of like wrist, well, as I say, I've had eight wrist surgeries and this one, this last one, which was before Rio, uh, we crashed before Rio, did my wrist and it was either have the surgery before Rio or miss the Olympics or pretty much just not have the wrist fixed, um, man up, have a have an injection um, into the little capsule there and you would be, you know, be able to compete. So, so obviously I went for that option. Um, and then, you know, three, three months after the Olympics, after some time off, uh, Mike was like, yep, yeah, we'll get your wrist fixed for you. We'll do. And we went into his office and we sat there and he was like, and the way he presented it to me was like, like it was completely normal okay. and he was just like yeah um so if you like we can do it under local blah 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 um and i was like yeah yeah just agree and signed these papers went off two days later came for my surgery and i was in, in basically i just walked out the office and agreed to have two wrist surgeries done while i was awake um i turned up and then i'm on the the fear on the bed in the operating theater and he's He's, um, They've got a know. screen, obviously, between you. Or did, uh, you just just see like going just on? on my arm. So yeah. at first I could, but the maddest thing was he uh, he all of a sudden was like, like I ended up becoming a part of like a part of the group. So he was like, he put, and it's mad to think that this is what surgeons like. They must come up with some wacky things because once they've knocked you out, it's They're like right, we, bleed, need, yeah. we need to like we yeah. need to get this fixed, you know. So uh, and I'm lying there on this bed, and he's like, right, we need to somehow get your arm up in the air hanging so he brought these like little rope like crane ropes with a hook on the end and he put um, a rubber glove on my hand um, and then rolled it up to my fingers and then duct taped it and then he put the hook medical grade duct yeah, tape, yeah and then he put then he put the uh, the hook through the rubber glove so then i could like rest my weight into it and then my arms were like dangling in front of me like either side of me on this like rope crane i could relax and then he would then then literally just as he starts doing it, I was like, oh, so um, how many times would you say you've done this? And he just looked at me and went, yeah, I've never done this. You're the <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, you're the first one that's ever agreed to let me do it while you're awake. And I, I just looked at him. I said, what was the surgery for? Like what did, what did um, do? So one of them was to like basically I had to have the bones that I had some um, like floating like bones basically mm. between all the little kind of um i don't really know all the technical terms so yeah i had some like floating bone which i needed to have cleaned off and then i had to have like um the ulna the head of the ulna needed to be shaved away to make room for basically the the bones to move and my li my ligament to be um screwed into on one side and then on the left arm it was i have a i already have a screw through the scaphoid so i had to have that opened up and then he he tried to get the screw out to actually put a but then the, the basically the bone started to crumble as the um as he was taking the screw out so that that didn't happen and in the end he ended up taking a little piece of uh, like cartilage from underneath the wrist and he tied it like a little pretty ball around uh, is that what you said to him yeah around <laughs> like the that pretty much around the lunate scaphoid bone because that's what I'd, I'd, I'd snapped the the lunate sca scaphoid ligament so and because the scaphoid had a screw in it and we couldn't take the bolt out the screw we actually didn't have a bone to, to bolt it into. Jeez. So he basically was just like, right, we'll get this piece of ligament and we'll, we'll tie it round. And the reason he wanted me awake was while I was in middle of surgery, he could say to me, right, clench a fist, open a fist, like, and, and like move the wrist. So then we could see whether it was going to work or not. And if it didn't work, then obviously he could try something else, but it, it, it worked. If anything, he made it a bit too stiff, um, which he said he might go in and loosen it off, but I just said, nah, I could just give up wrist. with that. <laughs> yeah, good stiff wrist. Um, yeah, Thanks, comes Dave. comes in handy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, like, um, as I was just saying, uh, not to compare surgery stories, but the, it was just after Michael Jackson had died, and obviously Michael Jackson was injecting a lot of uh, painkillers. He was like, um, 
uh, like really strong pain and sedatives as well to make him sleep at night. I was lying on the bed and the anesthetist came over and he injected me. And then like if you've had general anesthetic a bunch of times and this darkness just comes in from the side. I remember them saying to me, don't worry, this is what Michael Jackson died of. And, just went, <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, no. <laughs> well, when I, when I actually had that, um, there was one time, and you know, like in your pre-op, they always ask you like your weight, yeah. your height, all that stuff. I must have told them the wrong weight because obviously they work <laughs> out how much dose to give you based yeah. on like your weight and things like that. And this one time, I, was like, I was, think I was like 17, no, 18, 19. And this was probably like my fourth opera, my fourth wrist surgery or something. And uh, literally as I went in, the woman was like, just as she was putting it in, she was like, and you'll start to go to sleep now any moment. And she put it in. And literally, I felt it go cold on my arm. And I felt a bit drowsy, yeah. but I didn't get knocked out. Oh. And then all of a sudden, I saw her panic. She like, <laughs> I saw her at the bed go. She looked up at the other like, anesthetist and was like, he's not going. <laughs> <laughs> and then she like quickly scurried off. And about two minutes later, came back, give it me a boom. Like must have put it in boom. And I just knocked out. And I remember that was like, the worst to try and come round after that. I think I slept for like 15 hours after really? this. Because just yeah, going, just guessing. She, yeah, she must have obviously, like I must have told them the wrong information. They knocked me out, didn't knock me out. Give me like, just give me double dose and it just knocked me out. I was like, Jeez. oh, that was like the the worst hangover. How do you, you, how do you mentally get over injuries? Because, you know, you must have worked so hard up to it and then you have a crash and then suddenly like it changes everything. I mean, you have had so many crashes. It just comes with a sport. You then, just like you just accept it. it yeah so you get injured it's one of the things i mean for the first like when it happens obviously you're like a bit bummed you're like shit come on man like this is not ideal it's not what i wanted it's not the right time wish it could have happened like shoulda woulda coulda you know i shouldn't have done that if i didn't do that it wouldn't be fine so but i find myself certainly with myself and a lot of bmx's that I come across i think we're very good at within the first 24 hours just being like once we've crashed it's like boom right we've crashed mm. right well, I just need to get fixed so then I can get back on my bike and compete in at a high level as soon as possible. And it's almost like, I guess we're very fortunate with British Cycling and, the, and the, the medical care that we get is you crash, you get seen to instantly. If you need surgery, you're having surgery almost like within 24 hours. Yeah, yeah. And I, with, and I with, got bumped by a footballer from mine. Oh, no way. No, yeah. <laughs> and, for, <laughs> and, for, and then like literally within, you know, 48 hours afterwards, you're already being seen by the medical team. You've got game ready, things like that. Within a week, two weeks, you, you're already like, well, within a week, you know, three or four days, you actually can be back training, you know, yeah. whether it's like training your legs or yeah. if... I think that's what we can say. Like, like maybe if you don't get mechanics, like one thing BC is amazing at is like the rehab and the care that they give to yeah. people with physical injuries, I guess. Unbelievable. I mean, even if you look at Vicky Williamson, like being told that she probably couldn't walk and now she's World Cup competitive. It's like that a lot of that's been done by like um, Bisham Abbey, the guy, um, you know, Hannah and all the guys that we have at physios and physios, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. But well, then on the psychological point, obviously Liam uh, had a list injury, had multiple list injuries and then it was one list injury too many and they were like, we can't do anything about this. Yeah. Like another two parter for you. Um, how many more of list injuries do you think you've got in you? And do you think, like say if you injure your list again, do you think that's me? Is oh that, no, no, I know it's me. Um, oh, really? If you yeah, get another yeah. one, that's it. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm walking, I'm walking the, 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 the tightrope of one more crash and wrist injury, and I'm, I'm done. You Jeez, know? I'm out. Um, but then the wrist I'd, braces should do the job. Yeah, that's really, why. I, like, they? I mean, I wear them, um, and then the actual wrist braces I wear, they're not for support or anything. They're actually for um, protection. Uh, well, they're a prevention. I wish I just had them, you know, <laughs> ten years yeah, ago, yeah. twelve years ago, when I, when I first did, did my wrist break. So. Uh, but yeah, I've already, like, I mean, the past, I think it's the past four surgeries, um, I've pretty much been told from, yeah, like when Phil Burt was around, um, Hannah, um, Mike Hayton, the wrist specialist. I mean, he's the best, he's the best wrist surgeon in the hall, hand and wrist surgeon in the whole of Europe. And the last four times I've been on the, um, on the surgery table, he's like, yeah, I can't guarantee you're going to be able to compete after this. Um, maybe you should look at like changing your sport. And I'm like, nah. And when I came back after that, I think after I came back after the fourth one and the fifth one, I remember Phil Burt looking at me and he was like, like, it's not possible for mm. you to ride a bike. Like, I don't know how you, like Phil actually looked at me and he was like, I do not know how you are riding a BMX bike. He's like, it, it, in, the amount of damage which is in your wrist, you should not be able to ride mm. a BMX bike. 
and so does that do, so i guess there's a point where like so i always think when i'm watching like formula one it's like it's a skill it's just essentially it's a skill-based sport and i'm kind of thinking like why do you get too old to be able to drive a formula one car and i think it must be that kind of risk element inside so like if you're driving a formula one car and you're going into that corner you need to be 100 percent sure that you're going to come through the other end fine yeah and young guys can do that yeah but then when you get a bit older people start to think oh what if this spins off and i die um, but is, is, is that ever in the back of your mind when you're doing a start um, or I guess not because you're still successful yeah no not really like I mean there's definitely times where yeah there's been numerous amount of times you know when it's got really tight down the first straight or going into a corner and I've been hit by someone and then like I look back at it and I go oh, I probably could have carried on going then but I'm like I'm not ashamed of saying it like I can look back and go you know what like the reason I didn't continue there was because I didn't want to risk run the risk of crashing yeah like I know I'm one wrist break away from, from you know, the cool uh, career injury. ending. But we are so. like this now on the track. So like it, if you see a gap, you don't really dive into the gap anymore. So like, just to be honest, I think that's, that's part versus. of the point as to why I stopped. Well, I, n- I was never that good at Keelans, but that's kind of why I, I never really clicked with me. I always kind of thought, I, I, n- I never, because to put in a Keelan, it, you know, there's a lot of crashes. Um, like none of them are like well, there's been a few ones where there's been people like impaled by various things or like a punctured lung or something like that or going over the barrier so I think as the sport's got faster it's got tougher in terms of the injuries are getting worse but in, in Keelan I just the members started to think like I don't want that gap yeah, like yeah. Uh, it's not I mean, it's not worth it and, and I think you've always been like that I think yeah, yeah. Well, when I was young, it's I mean, like, I was it's a junior, like <laughs> I used to go for any gap, but now... Uh, Did like, you? Because it's be, it's it's I, I remember lighting up the A6 and you'd sit in traffic. As a junior. Want to filter as, through. A, as a junior. <laughs> like, okay. I'm a very safe rider. It's a very safe rider. <laughs> but, yeah. I mean, yeah, exactly that. It's 100%. I look back at when I was, you know, 15, 16, 17, 18, new into elite. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't give... Yeah, I didn't. I didn't really care at all. You know, I was genuinely. I would make moves. If I crashed, I crashed. I accepted that I'd crash. But certainly, it's as not I, even that. It's almost like if I die, I die. It, like so, it, you so don't even think about it. You just no, do no, it. Yeah, like it. it just, yeah. And then certainly, as I've got older, it's definitely crept into my mind a lot more. Of like, right, yeah, I don't bounce like I used to for one. Especially so. now you've seen like such horror stories, like well, especially like your sport. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I mean, you've got Sam, you've got thing, but I mean. This is the, what I said to. But just remember, to talk for the for people who are listening and don't know about BMX, let's talk about Sam a little bit. Yeah, we'll talk about Sam and Yeller. I mean, they both. Um, Sam went to a, the, the track one day for a training session. Bearing in mind, Sam's probably the fastest man to ever walk grace the earth on a on a BMX bike. You know, he's he was he well they call him Sam the man because he's the man. You know, um, and he went to training one day, warming up. I think he was like two or three laps in. Had a freak accident, flipped off the back of the bike. He's paralyzed now, you know. Um, he's obviously trying to rehab to, to try and walk again um, properly, but um, at the moment he's still he's still not able to do that, and he's he's wheelchair bound, you know. And um, Yellow Van Gogh, um again a freak accident. He was late for training. Well, from what I've been told from his teammates, you know, turned up to a session a little bit late. The other guys were already on the track. He wanted to catch up to the session. Um, he's basically in Papendal in Holland where the, the Olympic training center is. He went straight up to the start hill, put his helmet on, went out for his first warm up lap, went straight down the start hill, halfway down the start hill, realized there was a there was a metal chain at the bottom, hit the metal chain, flipped over the handlebars and caved his face in at the first jump, you know, on the first takeoff and, and again, like he, he was he was in hospital for a while. I think he was in a coma for for, for a good few weeks, you know, and, and, and now he's still doing rehab, you know, on um, I think yeah, he's, he's obviously. I'm, I'm I'm not sure of all his of the the small little details of his injuries, but he's obviously yeah. He's like another when like I've seen him, injury, guess, yeah, yeah. When I've seen him, you know, like uh, his face as well. Like half of his face is not like always functioning. It gets really, it gets tired really quickly. You know, he has um, like his hands always curled up. Um, yeah, as I say, I don't know the details. I'm just trying to obviously explain to the listeners what what he kind of looks like. He has a limp and things yeah. like that. So he's not. He's basically not going to be able to ride a BMX bike again, and, and he's, he's only just about struggling to walk. Sometimes he has to he has so to walk with a crutch, you know. So does, it, does that make you angry then? When when the the designers at Rio put in a ridiculous jump, do you do you think like how much do you guys actually value me? How do you, how much? Do you oh value yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. This is why I think it's only just really come come about within the, B, the the sport of BMX of actual having a riders commission and us actually standing together. So. Um, and it's only, and it's took, it's probably took six years of us to continually, when we go to races and we turn up and these tracks were, were 
not like they was unsafe to compete on and race on and ride on and 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 weather conditions whether it was you know super windy and it was just too windy to race in um uh, we've done so many you guys are getting decent air and if you get caught by the wind that's oh yeah, yeah like and we've raced in some horrendous conditions you know absolute like I've seen the Sturt Hill have, an, have a running water of like a waterfall down oh, the geez. front of it and we've been sent off it, you know. It's like, right, okay, if you can do it, you can do it, go. And it's, um, but that's obviously not what you want to compete in. And then again, you take the risk of, of actual serious injury. Mm. Like you, you, you times it by 10, you, you know. see, this is just... what happens at the track all the time because we go to like Newcastle and Lime Sprinters League <laughs> and be like, oh, that track's a bit damp. Yeah. <laughs> I think we'll just go home. So, 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 so but... <laughs> But but then, when you guys talk about that, it's actually quite, yeah, it's not, it's, it's sports dangerous, but it's a new level. It's yeah, an unacceptable level. When we've only just got to the point of, you know, like literally saying, standing together when the weather is bad, when the track's not right, to the point of where the, like at the World Champs, that first day of practice in Azerbaijan, it was mega windy, you know, I think it hit up to like 40 mile an hour winds and we, I saw, I think I think it was about seven junior riders got stretched off within about 35 minutes of I practice. love how they always put the younger ones up first to test it. <laughs> yeah. track but we like, is it track dry? We'll put some kids and up then, and, and see how they was, do. And it was literally like it was myself, like Liam, obviously Liam wasn't competing, but he was there with his riders that he was coaching. And, and he was like, and Liam, Liam really lost his rag with it because I think in the end he, he turned up at the race with like three junior riders and all three of his riders hit the deck due to the wind and all got stretched off and into an ambulance to the hospital. So Liam obviously stood with us that day and, and it was really good because we actually, you know, we, we all came together and just said, you know what? Like, no, we're not going out competing. We're not going out on that track, putting ourselves at risk and, 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 and looking at injuring ourselves like that, you know? Um, Cause that's the tricky thing because there's always, there's always some maverick out there who's like, that I was the issue, it, yeah. that was the issue for so many years. Um, as I say, it takes because, because like they might not be the highest up in the rankings, but they're thinking if the top if the top eight guys aren't going to ride, this is going to be my win. Yeah. Amazing points, you yeah. know, especially like in, especially leading into the Rio Olympics. That's mm. why I say it's taken you know seven, six, seven years for us to actually start to say you know stand together, because there was always these people were you know the top the top twenty guys, top twenty five guys would be like, nah, this is this is not right. We're we're being we're not being treated right. Uh, we need to stand together and, 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 and make a change. And then literally you would always get, you know, some Colombian, some Argentinian, which is probably, you know, top 60 rank in the world. He's, he's, that's his chance to actually make a final and actually be like, yeah. So he'd get up on the start, like, just get up on the start gate or on the track and he would send it. And then as soon as one sends it, it's like, well, if that kid can send it, everyone can do it, you know? And it's like, well, it's not a fact that we can do it. It's the actual risk that you're putting us in. Yeah. To do, like, we, we, we're we're comfortable. Do, like we can do that. It's not an issue of actually we don't have the skills to go and do it. We have the skills to do it, but we're not prepared to double, triple the risk of, of you know, crashing yeah. and really hurting ourselves. So, so yeah. And I guess it's, it does, it does come with the sport, but it's getting better now, you know, and, and I so love the sport. Up to and, it a bit and, and, and yeah, they're definitely waking up to it more. And as I say, as I get older, I'm, I'm certainly not, um, I'm certainly thinking more in the long term about my health rather than just being in the here and now and and, and as I say like I, this is pretty much what I said to the doc and and Phil and even Mike Hayton when 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 they said to my wrist oh you have you ever looked at another sport I was kind of like well nah like I love BMX I love right well I just like I just love riding anything on two wheels so well, let's talk about other sports then because um obviously you know Liam did a little transfer into track cycling mm -hmm. It seems like a lot of the guys in the early season. Did you do anything early season this year in the track, or was yeah, that? Yeah, through um, so December we spent the whole December. Yeah, on the, on the track. And you think that's added to your program as well, or? It was definitely. It was. It. I think there was a lot of benefits for it for us. Um, what do you think was good about it? Um, I think mental the mental process of actually just, you know like change. stepping away from stepping away the from BMX, BMX arena, just trying Ste something different. Yeah, stepping away from the BMX arena, something that we're constantly on. Um, leading into Christmas, I think it added to our training at the time because um, it was a winter block. We was looking at, you know, um, building a lot of muscle and building. Basically, I use it as like getting strong as fuck. Basically, that's that's my term to the gym coach is how strong can I get through the winter to allow myself to perform better for the season after. And and well, that's kind of where you're heading with your training at the moment a little bit. Just get as you know strong. As strong as yeah, you as can. As big I as think. I can. Um, yeah. And then try and transfer the 
the strength you made in the gym onto the onto the bike. It's pretty simple, really. It, it is. It's not like I, I look. I say I tell this to to parents all the time within BMX. It's like it's not rocket science, you know. Um, and and for example, for us at through winter, we do a lot of overgeared stuff on bike strength. We call it um, trying to transfer that power that we 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 produce in the gym and we train for in the gym. Actually, put it onto a bike again, not static uh, movement. We want it in a bit more of a dynamic sense. So, so for us, it just lined up going on the track side of things to, you know, go on some really overgeared things, um, try something new, give a bit of a fresh mentality, like going out to Christmas, come back from Christmas and then start fresh on the BMX track of, you know what, right. Um, and, and just, yeah, we used it as a training tool and, and I think everyone enjoyed it. Certainly I enjoyed it. Um, yeah, it was mega. You had a mechanic for a change? We didn't have a mechanic. <laughs> we still didn't have a mechanic. <laughs> we got given our bikes and it was like, right, oh, there you go. I think we, we had two we had two gears. That's all we had as well. I think we had something we had some I think we had a hundred and twelve inch gear. That's all we got given. And we had like is is an, I wanna say like a ninety two inch gear, is that small? Yeah, that's pretty small, it's yeah. Like, like warm up gear, gear, yeah. Yeah, yeah what well, so we had that basically we only had the two gears to pick mm. from. Um but compared to BMX, like that's still bigger than like the ninety two is gear is still bigger than what we would mm. run um so, so but like, then like, but then we got to the point of like well we're going to do we we set ourselves a challenge within the bmx group of right what standing lap can you do what flying yeah i remember being there do? for that it was and so what good. standing quarter could you do yeah. and it was like and then it was like actually right we've got these two gears to pick from um it was kind of like oh can we see if we can beat phil's ever sl slowest ever time for like a hundred me hundred meter spin or something like pretty that much. yeah it was good pretty much um so let, let's move on to like uh we're going to speak about your tats a little bit and a little bit about like the bmx culture because it's, uh -huh. it's a real different culture to track cycling like mm -hmm. track cycling is very much uh I don't have any statistics to back this up, but from like feel, it's it's very much a middle class white sport. Mm -hmm. BMX a lot more diverse uh, yeah. in both aspects, I guess. Yeah. Um, so like, uh, I guess I guess so that, that kind of leads to a lot of arguments in the gym about the music and things like that sometimes. Hundred percent. It <laughs> that's where the airports come in handy. <laughs> that's what the airports come in handy. Or oh, the airport, tray yeah. walking and Kai walking around with them. And Quillen, they and, have airports. And you as well. I've actually started doing it recently. Um, yeah, because I actually, I, I was I was completely against this. I was like, oh, I'm quite, because I'm quite diverse in my music background. You know, my dad, grew, I grew up listening, like my dad. Loved. Well, yeah, for sure. Because if we were like, struggling with the music, we'd always go, Kyle, Kyle likes it, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> like, I'm, uh, yeah, as I say, I'm, I, I like all genres of music. So to me, whatever you put on, I was kind of like, I was feeling it. And, but like Trey, Kai, Quilla, and they're like um, South London, um, Peckham, and they have this like grime and, yeah. you know, um, what do they call it? Trap. Drum and uh, yeah, trap music. So they literally, that's all they listen to constantly. They can't listen to anything else. So as soon can't as lift it, anything else as well. As soon yeah. as anything else is on, yeah, like that's what I mean. annoyed. Like, you see their faces changing. So, so like, now oh. they actually turn up to the gym with headphones on. They're like, they don't oh, even, wow. they don't even start the session without them. They're like, boom, straight in. And I don't <laughs> even know what it's in. It's probably just like gigs, you know, like, ah, oh, down the microphone. <laughs> and you can see him. Like if you ever watch Trey, if you ever sit back and watch Trey, you will always see him at some point. Like if he's going for a lift, you'll see him all of a his finger will come up his hand will start waving and he'll be like <laughs> maybe shaking his head really aggressively and like you could tell he's getting himself in the zone and you don't know whatever like he could be listening to Barbie Girl but he's like because mm, mm, there's, there's so much diversity mm. in the music taste in the team because like uh, a lot of the palas tend to a lot of the palas are a little bit older they tend to like a lot of like rock and roll you obviously you're into and I'm into as well a lot more kind of like electronic house kind of stuff you got Trey with uh Trey and Quillen and, and Kai as well with like a lot more hip hop kind of thing. So there's, there's always an argument in the gym about the music basically, but I think always. we win most of the time to be honest. Yeah, I think you, just you, need to I be think the first one get, in the I think gym you guys get in, first. Yeah. Yeah. I think you guys get in first. I don't know what, what it says on your program, but our gym session says 10 a.m. and we rock up at 10 a.m. And, and you guys seem to be there. Mate, that's 10. 10 minutes late. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say, you guys always seem to be there like quarter to nine. I think I'm, I'm certain you all just do it just to put the music on. You're like, ah, yeah. Sometimes we get it is. Uh, <laughs> we just, I turn up half an hour before now because we get total. I remember one time <laughs> we, to, like, we, uh, we came back from Australia and we were like training in the warm that's the future. So it was like, we came into the gym and we clanked up the temperature to about 28. <laughs> and then Kai, uh, sorry, um, Trey walks in and he's like, what the fuck? 
Is yeah, this? I can remember the <laughs> yeah, session yeah. he was like, Mate, there was fuck it yeah, well. Because as well, he lifts in um, tracksuit bottoms as well most of the time. Turtleneck. Yeah, and he's like, <laughs> and he comes in and he, the, the Trey, when he walks in the gym, he has his cap on, he's got his jumper still on and tracky bottoms and he's lifting shoes and he walks in and it's only when he gets warmed up he starts to take his layers off. But before that, he's literally, and I remember that session, he's like, whoa, fuck <laughs> it. And I remember he like grabbing his collar and his shit, he's like <laughs> wafting, he's like, whoa, fucking hell, so Scott, it, what's it, going it, on? It's fair to say, and like uh, in BMX there's a lot more like bravado and stuff like that like does that oh. does that so say you know you're lining up and like you know Kai's talking about going in the inside line back at Glasgow and all that kind of thing does that bravado like carry onto the track a little bit and you're talking about the Swiss guy cutting you up as well is there a little bit of that kind constant. of macho constant macho kind of I'm yeah. going to show this guy what I can do because I think I that uh, with splint there's a little bit so like if you're actually in the splint events you're sitting next to each other and then you do that death stare when you're rolling off and all that kind of yeah, thing yeah. and you never want to be the one to look forward um, so there's the, like a little bit but like BMX just seems to take it to another level it's there's, yeah, like, there's see, a lot I, of, like, there's like a lot I've, of, I've watched the track and yeah. I've seen you guys do that and I think I'd just start laughing like <laughs> I'd be laughing at the other guy cause Mate, they can't see me I, could, the visor, I know but I think I'd just pop my visor off and just laugh and start winking at him or something because I just couldn't I, could, I don't think I could do that so yeah, we were back and we we're talking about um, like Bavado and BMX. It's about like so. <laughs> I think you're one of the guys who, who don't carry it as much, but like, is is there a little bit of so? Say if you get into a semi or a quarter or something like that, and you know you're gonna have a tussle with a guy in the final, is there a little bit of you thinking I'll cut this guy up just to put put a kind of put a doubt in his mind? Hundred percent. Like for me, we always laugh because there's people people in the sport which they they we class them with like you're either one or the other. We don't yeah. you don't really get both um you either get people who cut up, cut people off on the um on the start hill yeah so literally like they come out the gate and they just move over on that person and there's so no rule can, against that you can no no you can do it first pedal second pedal third pedal whether you make contact makes no difference you know so so you've got people that just do that instantly cut people off and shut them out of the race or you've got other people which smash people in turns so they'll come in really aggressive and like as you enter the to the, enter the corner come up the inside and they'll just wait, wait, wait by the time. And then as you come out the exit of the turn, they will just full on hit so you. So which one are you? I'm a cutter offer. Okay. Uh, I cut people <laughs> off. Honest, yeah, like yeah, Liam, yeah. Liam told me a story that uh, Kroy Vandenberg used to talk to him on the gate. Oh, he'll yeah. Stood he, next he, to him he, and just t- talk to him. And was so like, oh, look at this person. Cra- <laughs> so crazy, like, crazy Roy, mate. Crazy Roy, yeah. Cricket, you call it like sledging. So you, you do a bit of like sledging at the start. Like. Hundred, well, this is the thing. Uh, because you always say stuff about Liam's sister and all that. Yeah. Well, yeah. well, I used to. Um, for me, like I think I'm very fortunate in the sense of I'm lucky that the fact that my preparation. If I sit and think about what I have to do, I really overthink it. Yeah. So my strength is right. Like I put my help. Like I just chill. I talk to people. I have a laugh. I have good banter, all the way up to the start gate. And then two races before my race comes on the gate, I put my helmet on one race before I put my goggles on and that's all the time I need. Just from as soon as I put my helmet on, that's it then. I'm like, I can shut myself into my own world, but... Yeah, that's so, so similar so, to spin cycling. Like, so so for yeah. me, it's so simple in the fact of like, I get away with actually, I can sit at the bottom of the start hill and people will be doing all these funny shit, you know, making like making comments, looking at people's bikes, you know, standing really close. Phil's used to go, psh, psh, psh. your yeah. tire's looking a bit, yeah. a bit flat. And, and, and I can always like, <laughs> is that what you used yeah, to he's do? Like, yeah, yeah. Have you got a puncture, mate? <laughs> <laughs> See how proud he looks. Yeah, no, he literally just goes like, psh, 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 psh. have you got a puncture, mate? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I think I'm very fortunate in the sense of like I can genuinely sit there and I can watch the race in front of me and watch a big crash happen and be like, oh, he just did. Do, do you remember when I, when I qualified last in Cop was Keaton Keen qualified second? I was the oh, whole that, yeah. the whole time like half for half. Now I said, Keen, you're looking a bit weak today. <laughs> you're, looking, you're looking tired. Are you okay? And he, qual- he had like a really really good qualifying that went like under ten seconds, uh. and I qualified last. And I put him out in the first round. Oh, it was me no. and him again in the first round. He was yeah, we, so angry. Because he's fuming. But that's that's what we're talking about in, sp- in spin cycling, though. Like, um, like myself and Jack and a few other guys like like to have a bit of a chat. Like, if someone if someone's sitting next to me in the start line and they're super focused, they got their helmet on. Like, you almost make a bit a bit, a, a bit of an issue of actually like touching like the leg, having trying to have a conversation with them, all that kind of stuff. Whereas you get like uh, you know Kian um, or a few other guys in the circuit as well. Like, it's it's just game on, and they they don't they don't they don't react to it at all yeah well that's the thing i think i'm fortunate in the bmx world because everybody does it you know everyone tries to so you're ready for it so like well just not that i'm ready for it i just 
don't get affected by it because so I switch on so because late. Because you've grown up with it. And because and, and I, I, I do my process so late, it's almost like you get to the top of the turtle and then they've kind of forgot about it then. They're like, because they know they need to get in their own zone yeah. to, before they can actually get on the gate. So, But does, does part of that bravado, so say, you know, you're walking through the airport or you're in the gym or something like that. Does some of that like, kind of like masculine image kind of thing, does that, does that help you get less shit on the start line or does it not make any difference? Because it seems no, like no, no, it seems like it seems less, like you know like um, it seems like the worst thing you can do to a BMXer is like not respect them. Yeah, pretty much. I think to an extent, yeah, you, you're probably right though. I mean, I get, I think either because I'm my, my probably my strong well my strongest part of the race is my, my start and first straight. Um, so for me, like over years and years of constantly having good starts, good first straights, like I've earned the respect of that. So. Yeah. It's almost like people know that they can't actually put me off my start because mm. the chances are if they put me off my start, I'm probably going to say, ah, fuck you even yeah. more. <laughs> and this cut off will be even yeah. more savage. I mean, I've been known to set my bike up on an angle, you know, oh, like really? if I'm on one of the outside lanes and I need to get to the inside of the track, I've been in seven and eight and I've been pointing in a diagonal. Like by the end of my first pedal, I'll be in lane six. By the yeah. end of the second pedal, I'll be in lane five, lane four. I've, I've like... <laughs> it sounds really bad now but i've made like people crash hard because of that you know but <laughs> no, that, you'd hate this sport but, but that, but, but, that in my, but that just in myself is just like again like you say it's just it doesn't even cross my mind you know yeah. it's like i get on like as soon as i put that helmet on and i go, go through my process it's like i know what i have to do yeah and i, and I don't care who it affects you know it's just like whatever I, it, you just like for me i cut all emotion off mm. from from what i do within bmx so once I've got on the gate and I do the race, like my emotion, like it's like emotionless, you know, once I've come across the line, then I'm back to being myself, you know, it's yeah. like, cool. Oh, I'll have a good laugh. I'll have a good chat and, and stuff. And, and yeah, like I don't, I'm like, that's why I'm not one to sit at, at a race and have my headphones on, you know, I find yeah. having headphones on playing music playing is one of the worst things for me. Cause I'll sit there listening to music and constantly be just going round and round in my head of who I've, who I've got in my race, what I need to do. Like, if I've had a really shit qualifying right, I mean, I'm going to have a shit pick. I'm going to have to qualify. I'm going to have to get out, get in front of everyone and like almost like make the, the job in hand a bigger, bigger than it actually is. So, so yeah, um, that's kind of how I work and, and how I enjoy it. But for sure, I mean, BMX, it's a constant, constant. At the end of the day, it's a dick swinging yeah. competition. It's a dick swinging competition. It comes within the team as well. Like, I, I, like you know, you, you guys don't hold back when it when it oh. comes if someone if someone doesn't tour the line it, no. it's almost like a kind of top dog situation a lot of time even within within the team itself yeah i mean it's, it's we, we 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 i think because we've traveled together we've been close for so many years and, and obviously like liam liam was the undisputed kind of top one for a yeah, while and when yeah he left, and, it was a bit and, of a void and, and power avoid i guess and, and who's Liam. the top dog now <laughs> i think i think i think they still fight about yeah. it i think there's still like yeah, yeah, I, think, I think i think i think if whoever you ask um it'll be it's different them. every time you know uh, you can say it's you it's okay no no i'm not gonna say it's me just because because <laughs> i know for a fact like if i turn around right now and say it's me the boys will listen to the podcast and they'll be like ah it's not fucking you bro mm. uh, like and then like it'll always get no matter which way you look at it something will get brought around it you know what i mean like if i said oh i'm the big dog i'm the i'm the, I'm the leader of the group right now They'll like Kai did better in the uh, uh, at Verona in Italy, so they'll turn around and instantly be like, "Well, you're only as good as your last race." So oh, Kai's okay. the big dog, you know. Kai's yeah. the way. so it doesn't like it always get like perfect example. I was playing Xbox yesterday with um, Kai and Trey and a couple of our friends, and for whatever we was on a team, and basically Trey died. Kai down the microphone was like, Kai, Trey, no, <laughs> shit. No, <laughs> shit. Trey's like, shut up, man, shut up. <laughs> and they're arguing down the microphone at each other at this Xbox game. And then all you hear is that they're like, we were laughing about it today because the next thing, Kai, Trey's like, but I'm better than you on this game, Kai. Like, I will beat you any any time, any place on this game, I will beat you. And straight away, Kai brought it personal and was like, yeah, yeah. yeah but you're shit at BMX. Oh. <laughs> and you're like, and like straight away, you're There's like, so many things and, personal. And, and, Trey just, yeah. and then Trey just started laughing and was like, ah, I always bring it personal. Yeah, 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 I always yeah, bring yeah, it personal. Yeah. But so no matter whatever you do, you always get put, I think you it, always get yeah. brought back down to yeah. earth. You know, I think it's like, wind your, neck, wind, wind your neck in, yeah. sort yourself out and, and, and yeah, just, just do your own thing, work hard. 
have it's a good time. That, yeah, yeah, like work hard, have a good time while doing it, make a lot of memories. And if you're successful, you're successful. If you're not, as long as you tried your best and you walk away from the sport um, with your head held high, then because you know you did everything you can. And I think, I think if you if you go if you go through your career with that mentality, then there's nothing more that you can ask of yourself. And and chances are you'll probably go on to to do bigger and better things in in other things. You yeah. know. So we'll we'll wind up on three last topics, I guess. So. Unless Phil, you have anything else to say? So we'll go first on, let's say, like life after sport. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you you've talked a lot about how you know you could go to training, you could be late, you could damage your list or whatever, and that could be it. Yeah. What does what does the future hold? Um, I mean, there's a few things in the pipeline. Um, I guess yeah. As I've as I say, if you asked me this question five six years ago, I wouldn't have had a clue what 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 I would I think I think now. a lot of people make the, the mistake of thinking talking about it is weakness but it's not I think yeah, having no. a backup makes you feel a lot better I mean I like Phil's going to be a big businessman <laughs> now, that, to be fair like I would <laughs> I would love to know what I do after cycling like this one of my biggest worries what am I going to do like mm. I've I've not been studying I haven't done it haven't learned anything all I've been doing is cycling yeah, and I have not got a clue what I want to do because because I don't know what I would enjoy big after business cycling. But that's what I mean. Like as I say, <laughs> look, like, look, like looking looking back, if you asked me that question six, five six years yeah. ago, I wouldn't have been able to tell you because, being honest, I wouldn't have thought about it. Yeah. I've not thought about it at all. Because it makes you feel insecure if you do, if you don't know. You just well, it was just it do. was just one of them things where I was just so caught up in trying to win BMX races that nothing else mattered, you know. But then the older I've got, is more, and the closer I'm getting to the end of my career, it's actually like uh, then you start think it starts, you know running around your head of actually what am I going to do after BMX and there's potential coaching whether I coach within the program on the development side of things or work under Marcus I'm not sure I mean I would I would love to to obviously be graced that opportunity if it came um, um, certainly because I do enjoy I don't really like I'll be honest I don't really like working with you know when I've done coaching clinics with clubs and things like that when there's you know, 40, 50 kids on the track at once. I don't really enjoy that kind of coaching because... Have you got your coaching quality? It's, it's or are you very, going underground? It's very... Um, it's very... <laughs> um, <laughs> Glossed over that one. Uh, it's, no, no, it's just very um, generic. Stress, very, yeah. very generic yeah. coaching. And I, and, well. I, and I always mm. find like it's not... Like the kids don't... Like I don't want to go to a training... Like train a group of kids or speak to a group of kids which are going to go home and be no better off than they was when they arrived, you know, so... Well, that, that's that, the thing. That I think when it comes to coaching, like you want to you work with the best because that's where your knowledge base is. Yeah, like, yeah. I remember when we did our level... To, uh, level two coaching you, str- you struggle you to really e- struggle explain the basic yeah because yeah. they're like teach this person how to look over their shoulder and mm-hmm. it's like or well, just do it yeah, yeah. It's, like it's, it's so sick. simple to you because you, you, you work it down so a, much yeah because yeah. yeah i can understand that which i guess that's the same fear with me i guess really it's um to the extent of i'm like i, I want to make i want to make people fast and and stand on top of the box you know so so from the yeah whether whether that's at British Cycling, whether it's at the UCI under Liam, you know, um, yeah, I'd love to go and do something like that. Um, it's it's obviously been mentioned um, amongst amongst yeah on the on the back burner, I guess. And then uh, for right now, like my my actual main plan right now is to 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 go in the army as a as a paratrooper. You know, uh, I've signed up to be jump uh, airplanes. Yeah, train. I'm a training training TA. Um, so have yeah, you ever jumped other plane? Uh, I'm not now, but it's just. He's going to do a tandem jump with us for the next <laughs> podcast. I can do that. I'd love to come and do that. I'll, I'll do that. Sa- d- sign me straight up. <laughs> sign, sign me straight up. But nah. Um, and again, people have always asked me like, they're like, what? Like that seems like really strange. I wouldn't have, have expected that. And it's like, well, I think if I when I left high school, I went to college, and if I didn't go from college onto the program, um, from like kids from my area and like a lot of my friends now i think it's quite common for us to yeah you know we we don't get we don't get grace with yeah we don't get born like we're not born with a silver spoon in our mouth so it's kind of like yeah we 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 just it just seems to be a, a natural um progression into the army you know whether that's the RAF, the navy you know the army um, and i think i would have gone into into the army probably from college so so yeah, um, it's just something that again I could see myself. Certainly the powers with it being like the elite, the elite side of, of the British Army. Um, I just see that as a new challenge, you know, something different, but still kind of, you know, excel ex- excelling at physical, you know, um, yeah, that that physical exertion that you do, you know, pushing yourself to the limits mentally, physically. Yeah. Um, uh, There's definitely crossover. It's quite a get the camaraderie. 
Camelardi Legimented, yeah. all that kind of thing. Yeah, which it's obviously they, they, they do have so many, so many um yeah, crossovers. So I think for right now that's definitely something that really excites me and gets me, yeah, gets my back up. So I'm look I'm looking forward to, to, to seeing where that, that path takes me, you know. Um I don't know yeah, if I'll continue to be to be a TA or once I finish finish my BMX career and, and, and if I've really enjoyed it, whether that means I'll I'll go more, you know, go full time and maybe join two or three para and, and go on tour or something like that or or whether you get graced the opportunity of going, you know, one para working with the SAS and, and being in the SAS. So I don't know. But just see, but that that's definitely something that really excites me. You got a bit more direction forward. than like a lot of other athletes out there, I think. Yeah, I just it just really excites me, as I say, and I'm looking forward to that that chapter and, and yeah. that challenge of of pushing myself to that limit. So let's uh, let's finish on a fun one, I guess. Um, so I guess I really got to know Kyle Kev um, at the uh, post Olympic party <laughs> in 2016. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> where, where were you? First of all, where were you, Phil? I was at home. Okay, okay, I'm going to bring up the story right now. Do you know about this story? No, I don't <laughs> no, okay. know. I know. <laughs> You've brought the story up quite a few I'll times. I'll bring it up again. So, um, obviously, Phil and I had quite an successful, successful Olympics. I'm pretty sure I told you at the time anyway. So, like, he I was probably very drunk. <laughs> 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 I was probably very drunk. But so. you don't realize, like, you've got yeah. that Olympic village and everyone's living like a saint for, like, the, the two years, three years before. We were and playing then, like, Civilization something for two clicks. hours a day. Yeah, no, but that, that, every day. Yeah, but exactly. It's a distraction thing, isn't yeah. it? Like no one, no one's up to any no, shenanigans. No fun. Um, but yeah, so Phil, Phil and I had a successful Olympic Games, and then uh, he had a few nights out with Bradley Wiggins. He had one more night left. I've had around five nights, and the last night with Callum was no, free. No, the worst. Th so I had the splint as well, which you were the reserve for. So you were being a bad reserve because you were too busy getting pissed instead of instead of sitting in the Olympic Village getting ready for being, getting the call up get, for the spin. Get ready, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, there was one night we could have had together. He goes, oh, mate, I wish I could, but I'm too tired. Oh. On honestly, <laughs> honestly, I was sat there and I was like just falling asleep. I just I could not stay up, couldn't stay up. And I, I think that might have been the night that we ended up at Red Bull as well. And and it, no, that, that wasn't it. <laughs> That well, wasn't it. <laughs> well, for the sake of the story, it is. <laughs> it was. <laughs> but I remember in uh, Rio, you did pretty similar. Remember when? I um, can't remember what day it was, but we'd we'd had a heavy heavy night the night before, and yeah. and obviously we finished. We competed a lot later than you, so you'd have quite a few more heavy nights than us. Mm. And I think we had two heavy nights on the bounce, and then. Liam had already gone out in town to meet his his parents, and and then I was kind of left in the village on my own, and I was like looking for. Then I, we'd obviously you start looking around for people uh, who aren't in tracksuits. Yeah, <laughs> and then I was like, then I was like looking, and then I came. Then me and you was obviously in the same yeah. room together, the same same apartment. So, and I like saw you coming in. I was like, what are you doing? And he was like, oh, I'm going to bed. I'm tired. I'm like. See? Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, like, let's 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 go out though. Like, come on, like we're gonna go and meet LP. There's a big party going on. Let's go, let's go. And you was like, oh, just let me have an hour's sleep. And then, <laughs> and then literally, I was like, okay, yeah, I'll wait for you if you're only having an hour's sleep. And then I'm literally sat in the front room watching Brazilian TV, reading <laughs> reading the subtitles. Desperate for night out. <laughs> desperate. I'm desperate. And I'm clock watching. My wrist is like this. Clock watching the whole time. It's been an hour, and I'm like, I open the door, Callum's room. I'm like, he's still sleeping. I like left it like, it was like an hour and a half and I was like knocking and I was like hello <laughs> <laughs> are we going are you, are you feeling up to it are you ready <laughs> and you was like just another hour and I was like <laughs> and then literally I was like right one more hour and then if you're not ready in an hour I'm going and then literally he was like the second hour he was like I'm sure I walked in and I was like yo Callum are you ready and you was like yeah, I'm not really feeling it. I was like, nah, fuck you. I'm going. <laughs> like, I'm getting ready and going. And you was like, okay, okay, I'll get a shower quickly. Yeah, we'll yeah, go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then that's we went. A, that's the thing. I will not say no. Like at the point, a point where someone says, <laughs> the point that someone has to wait two hours. Yeah, yeah but still, that's the, that's the difference. Because like, some I patience. Tried, I tried to convince you a whole bunch of times. At the point where someone says, okay, I'm going to go without you. That's when I'll, I'll spring into action. I'm ready to go. But I mean, from, I've got an amazing story from the Olympics. When have uh, you? I'm, like to be honest, I didn't know about the sleeping story, so I have no idea where this is going. Yeah, no, 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 not, no, this is nothing to do with you. Oh, this sweet, is, um, okay. this is literally, Liam was at GB House. Um, 
we was together. We it was the same. Yeah, night. yeah. Because so we tried to get left, into Flinch We tried house. to get into the was it the Dutch, Dutch house? house, Honeycomb house. Yeah, the, the Dutch house. You got in and I didn't get in. <laughs> <laughs> so then, like, they, really? Yeah, yeah. So we turned up and like, Callum was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got a friend who's gonna get us in, so we're gonna. Get what's in. your friend? Uh, Dutch house. Who was it? It was a Dutchie, I think. Yeah, one of the Dutch sprinters, probably. Yeah, I think it was like a Dutch sprinter or something. I didn't know who he was either. I've not a clue who he was. So, like, Callum, and this guy comes out and he's like, hey, how are you doing, man? Like, brilliant and stuff. And then Callum's like, yeah, like, come on. They go in and they walk in. And then Callum turns around and looks, and I'm like, being stopped at the door. And I'm like, oh, like, I'm (laughs) good. I'm not getting in. So, basically, I'm not going. Then Callum just kind of just went, See you later then. So oh, literally, that's, that's I was terrible. Like, so, so, no, no, because no. I, said, I said, I told him it was cool. I said, no, nah, no, nah, it's fine. Oh, I'm right. going to go to GB House and meet LP. And literally, I don't know what, how this even happened. I was like, oh, I saw a taxi and I saw somebody getting a taxi, this like blonde guy. And he had a GB, well, not a GB, he had a, an accreditation pass on. So I was thinking, he's an Olympian. I'll run in. I ran to this taxi ripped the door open and I sat in and I said, where are you going, boys? And as I looked, it was Alistair and John Brownlee. <laughs> <laughs> the Brownlee brothers. And I was like, all right, guys. And he was like, what do you do? I was like, BMX. And he was like, fucking yeah. <laughs> and then They're good guys to me. They, they enjoy it. Night, night. Like, literally, we got in this taxi. I was like, where are you going? And he was like, GB host. He was like, yeah, we'll come to GB host with you. <laughs> and I remember walking into GB host and Liam was like, Liam saw me walk in with them and he was like, that's the Burnley brothers. Like, I was like, <laughs> yeah, I'm dead cool mates with them now. Like, yeah. I'm my best friends with them. <laughs> Mate, like, I, I think the thing that turned me against Dutch House was that you had to pay for the beer and then I found out that GB House was open bar, so I was straight yeah. over after that. Yeah. But, you know, that, you know, sticking together, camaraderie, that's the kind of thing you look for from a teammate, Phil. I let myself down there, I have to say. So. <laughs> yeah. They mustn't yeah. do that in Germany. No. They, no, they mustn't no, no. teach that in Germany. In Germany, they love... Stand alone. Night out after night out after night out, don't they? You know. I know. No, I don't. They're all awful. What about it. Berlin? Berlin's, d- Berlin's a different city. It's not Germany. <laughs> That's an exception. There's, there's still half a wall there. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> and on that note, we'll, uh, we'll wind up here. Um, so it's been great having you on, mate. Thanks for being the first guest. Yeah, thank My you. My pleasure. Thank you very and, much for uh, inviting me. Yeah. Yeah. Enjoyed any, it. Any finishing words? You want to shout out to your bike sponsor or anything like that? No, 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 it's good. Um, just thank you for having okay, me. So it's, and, uh, it's, not, it's not going well then. No, yeah, I don't have a bike sponsor <laughs> like, at the minute. That's the problem. I don't have a bike sponsor. So I'm like, yeah. Since I lame, will sort um, you out, mate. Yeah, so we'll, we'll, we'll see. Maybe I'll get one through this. If there's any bike sponsors out there, then uh, come and hit me up and we can chat and hopefully produce a, What's your, a world-class um, BMX bike. Instagram, Twitter? Uh, they're both the same. It's kevans26. So at kevans26. You will see the followers. Six flooding in i hope after so this. hope so I, like send them my way you know um send me messages give us some feedback and i hope you boys progress on well with the podcast and, Thanks, it, and, yeah, it, yeah. and it takes you good places i think it's good phil needs the, the money i think it's good for oh, the sport i, I the just <laughs> think it's good for the sport and it's good for yeah. a bit behind the scenes isn't it yeah i think it's great i think we yeah. don't have enough of that um certainly within 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 just the british cycling world i think everyone sees us just perform on track and 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 then that's it. There's there's no actual. There's more to in, us. So. There's there's a lot more to us, and there's a lot more personalities around the building than than people see on out on out on course. So. Yeah. Uh. So yeah, that will wind us up. And uh, next week we have a very special guest. We might actually be doing the inter- We might do the interview in a pool. In the pool. Maybe it's going to be twenty one on Friday. We'll find find out. Yeah. We will find out. So tune we'll in for out. that. And uh, thanks for listening. If you still managed it after two hours forty or wherever we're on. Yeah, thanks for listening and please subscribe um, at the Apple Podcast. You can pretty much listen to it everywhere and you can also view it on YouTube. So, Spotify. Um, any, everywhere. Everywhere. So everywhere. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. See you next time.